OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent modes. Right, you're very welcome along. It is Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday morning. Wednesday, Wednesday morning. It's Wednesday morning. Wednesday. It's very rainy out. We did oh a show God. yesterday. That means it's Wednesday. We did do a show yesterday. Yeah. 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 Woo! Time's a flat circle since COVID. Um, um, a lot happened. Yeah. Mm. A lot's still happening. Yeah. yeah. The days, the days and just at some in. point, stuff will stop happening. Mm. And then you'll be dead. Happy Wednesday, everybody. <laughs> On that morbid start to the morning. <clears throat> uh, if you want to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. OTB AM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. Colin, this is um, your first season with us, your first Movember with us. It's your first Movember with us too. So you, we didn't tell you while you were being conscripted into the show, slash, sorry, offered, uh, induced to join us, that you've got to do Movember. So... Ooh. I oh, wonder in the contract. It's well, it's you neglected to mention that. I did. I did. A legal Un- requirement until the last minute. You'll first, s- the first one with us. You'll see it's written. We've been here for three and a half years as the as the producer of the show. Oh yeah, yeah. I was still with you at all times. I, I mean, you know, remember. you're you're I'm either on the inside of the tent pissing out or you're yeah. on the outside yeah. pissing yeah. in. And I hear that you're you're doing it, Shane. I heard you commit to the show. I was only over there. You were only over there. I heard you commit to it. Well, it was there. I very much feel like a guest at the show in the setup. Yeah, you look. Pretty much, you've invited don't, me. Don't get comfortable. No. The colors not. behind you, the purple suits you. Yeah, I do like these colors, actually. They're you, very you're nice. one of those. Um, you're one of those like comedians who's just bubbled up, and we're giving you a few opportunities. Yeah, I make you either you either make it or you don't, yeah. and like we'll never see from you yeah. again. They've yeah. given me Saturday Night Live, but it's probably too early, and it, it doesn't go great. I'm uh, I, I'd be quite nervous about uh, November this stage because well, you you be the same column. You, you've do, you've darker hair than I do, so uh, I do. It Yours just look like bum fluff. True. Yeah, mine is. <laughs> mine yeah. can be bum fluffy, uh, but I've had it for so, for such a long period of time now that it's I know, but it's good for a change. You know, it's good. Change, good yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you'll have new pictures for your Tinder profile? Yeah, but most people I talk to are like, don't get rid of the beard. Don't get rid of the beard. Do you know what? Hold on to it. Do you know what? Sometimes you just have to tell most people yeah. to screw themselves and you're doing what you want because you're like an old man now. And True. Yeah. yeah. Stand up for myself. It's not, it's not popular. Oh, it's not popular. Beards aren't popular. <clears throat> no, no. The, 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 like shaving, changing yourself, mm. developing your person is not popular. No one, wants, no one wants you to change or get better. They want you to stay stuck. Yeah. What does in, in molasses. Slightly, preferably slightly decreasing. Yeah, quality, absolutely. 100%. The, yeah. That's ideal. Be, that, that's it working. I put a lot of weight on what the listeners think and the viewers. Well, I think the, if people want to let us know in the YouTube comments if either of us should, should uh, 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 hold on to or Well, I, I'd be loath now to praise you, but I thought that your uh, mustachio effort last year was fantastic. Very and good. I noted that you kept it. You retained it. Oh, yeah. And when that was mentioned, you um, dismissed the comment and moved on. So you didn't actually embrace your own change and your own development. Oh, no. So I how are we ever going to change as a culture if the person who's changing for the better doesn't embrace that and celebrate it? Well, so I feel like you should keep it. Start it in November, keep it in December, and in 2023, it's Mustachio Gilroy. Yeah, it was good. For the whole year. I would love that. Well, yeah. Um, Do a 12-month November. It was less It was left, less damer and more Selleck, I think. It was, it was, it was a decent, decent number. Not quite as dark as Tom Selleck made. It definitely wasn't Selleck. <clears throat> that was the ambition, but um, yeah, there was, there was, you know... I'm trying to fill you with confidence here, so we don't have to do it. We can you, you have to do it. That's that's how. Yeah. It's We're now on the record, and everybody's saying, "Yeah, go go for it, do it." Yeah, I've never done it. <coughs> I've never done go. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind trying it. Wouldn't mind trying, it. but it's, it's okay for me. Like I'm only on air sporadically. You know, I'm not. I'm not showing myself off every day for you guys. It's pressure. It needs to look good. And I think you should start practicing now. Sure, we're only we're only on, around the corner here. We're uh, we're weeks, mere weeks away. It's mere weeks. Well, I, I I my shave down has started. So could, do you have to start on the day, or what? Do you have to? Well, ideally, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you can. Sorry, I mean, if you're if you're that worried about it, you could shave it this week or next week, and then do that maybe by the end of November. I had great ambitions of doing the whole handlebar thing, but that actually takes years. Is it cheating if I if I shave everything now but leave the mustache? That's what I did last year. There was it was it was ruled inadmissible, and so I lost, even though I clearly had the best. Adrian one. Barry did that last year, I think. That's got what called I might, out. Got I called do out. That, that was counts. that was me. Yeah, I did that last year. Adrian won, I think. He did it properly. Oh, oh sorry. Just because he followed the rules, not because his moustache was. He was he, he was here apparently, you know. Ah, but yeah, yeah. No, <coughs> I was well, not, not paying any attention. No, but I was I was there with you in spirit. Yeah. Um, there's loads to talk about. We have rugby coming up later on. The Ireland squad's going to be named today. There's Leinster Munster at the RDS. Or sorry, at uh, the Aviva Stadium on Saturday evening. Um, uh, there is football. Good football tonight. Uh, Spurs versus Manchester United. The football last night. We made the decision uh, late last week not to preview last night's football. 
An excellent decision. Oh my God. Brighton and Nottingham Forest <coughs> was possibly the worst Premier League game I've ever seen. Although I did admire the colour contrast of the kits. I thought that was very aesthetically pleasing. But other than that, like it was nil-nil in injury time and fans were leaving. Yeah. And it goes back to Brighton not being able Can't to score that goals. traffic. Yeah, it was they, they peaked in Deserby's first game three goals at Anfield got a point from it they just love getting points like you know one point at a time they're, you know, it's not often you can see Brighton lose they lost to Brentford last Friday but generally they're, they're a very solid outfit and they were you know Trossard there was on the verge of becoming a really really good player mm. a few weeks ago <laughs> and Brighton were like God they have an amazing setup. but it's like they can't get over that tantalising line of being this progressive Premier League outfit that they so desperately want to be yeah. but last night like I, I kind of enjoy watching Forrest I want to see like their 18 million players come together and see if they can do something with it. But like, my God, you know, I was worried about those two fixtures yesterday when we were discussing them. I said, I'll give it a go because this is one of those games where it can surprise everyone. This could be like a Premier League Classic mm. 5 too. It was every bit what it was going to be on paper turn out to be in reality, nil-nil. If it was football manager, oh. you'd have thought there was something wrong with the game because it would have skipped right to 90 minutes. It's like there was no chances there. It was shocking. Go to the help exactly. section, what, what happened there? But it was literally, there was nothing happened at all. Yeah. And I actually didn't bother watching Palace Wolves, which was the game to watch yeah, it was the better with Nathan Collins game. back. Funny. Sent the half for Wolves. Brighton have gone from the team that couldn't stop scoring to the team that now cannot score 200 and something minutes that they haven't scored in since the, the three-all draw at Liverpool. Like, yeah, last night was one of those nights where like my dad was watching the match beside me and, and he was watching it. But like, I, I was sitting on my phone and I rarely do that watching a game of football nowadays in the Premier League because most of the game... You're not even watching this. You're on your phone. I know. I know. <coughs> Dad, why why can't we have the TV? <laughs> yeah. All right, it's a little insight into my life. Yeah, yeah there you go. Makes sense. Yeah. So I felt, I felt bad. I felt like a bit of a, a Gen Z even though I'm, I'm not a Gen Z. Um, looking at my phone last night during the match but I had no choice. It was brutal. Um, shocking to watch. Dean Henderson had a good save towards the end but you, you never felt like either team were... Like Brighton were all over them stats-wise but... Did we establish what you are? In terms of, oh, I'm a millennial. Like. You're a millennial. Oh, right. Yeah, I think from 95 onwards is is officially millennial. 95, 96, that kind of. Yeah, we're millennials. So you're a millennial too. Wow, Kyle. you're old now. I see your Jojo clearly. No, he's not. <laughs> Jojo is about two weeks between me and Jojo. Right. Uh, no, we are Jojo. Yeah, we're millennials, I think. 88. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's millennium. Millennium. Someone tell me in the comments sir. All I'm getting in the comments I hope there's no Gremlins in the system today There won't be Shane at all Can someone This is Shane in the comments Not you Can right. someone uh, Well we, we're guaranteeing nothing a Millennial uh, I'd I'd like call him, You're definitely millennial uh, 88 yeah. 88, 88 millennial All day long I, I actually watched the final episode of that Nepal documentary on Netflix last night the Final episode of which? The Nepal documentary You know the earthquake there in oh, right. 2015 It's very good It's three part series Instead of the football Or at the same Before. time as the football And then I was like oh, I can't watch this, this And then turned it off And then turned it back on It was kind of dual screening We were talking about Tom Brady Earlier in the week mm. obviously um, So he, he balled his offensive line Out of it on Sunday I thought that they were looking at him Going well if you'd shown up for work Maybe we'd be a little bit better Because he'd been at the Robert yeah. Kraft wedding The Robert Kraft wedding Was actually on the Friday so it wasn't traditionally he's he's been getting the <clears throat> he's been offered the Wednesday every week off it's called a Veterans Day and that's fine but he's actually off on the Friday and then um, also on Sunday Bill Belichick his former coach crushed the Cleveland Browns with his third string quarterback so it was like one of the all time great kind of coaching performances yeah. it also made him the second winningest manager in NFL history uh, head coach in NFL history so it was a big landmark victory for him and they were absolutely sensational. And so the contrast couldn't have been more stark between his former charge and uh, watching the documentary series at the moment. That's why this um, cropped up in my mind. It was uh, it's called Man in the Arena. It's made by it's made by Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. So it's like Tom Brady staring down the camera, telling you his his inner thoughts. And and you know if you're if you're into self help and you think you could become a cyborg, I think that um, you'd love it. And he's got great, amazing guests like Michael Strahan is um, the guest in the the year that they lose the Super Bowl. They go 16-0 and 0 in the regular season. They would have been the greatest team of all time. They, they probably were the greatest team of all time. They just get beaten in the last minute. But um, it turned out that... So Robert Kraft is the owner of the New England Patriots, right? And he hired Bill Belichick. And Bill Belichick selected Tom Brady. And there's been this kind of... There's a brilliant book about it. We, we covered it just momentarily. Had a brain fart and forgot the name of the author. Jeff Benedict. Jeff Benedict. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Benedict wrote this brilliant book about the three of them and how it's like a... The, you know, it's basically yeah. the, the shamrock... You know, there's one God, they're indivisible. It's, yeah. This is how we explain it. This is the shamrock. Um, Bill Belichick didn't go to the wedding. No way. He was working. No days <laughs> off. No days <laughs> off. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe, maybe there's a separation between them because he got rid of Brady and then Brady went on to win and maybe Bob Kraft wanted Brady to retire. You know, Brady and Giselle were the good-looking kids that he never had. 
uh, and successful. Um, yeah. That right. trifecta, I, li- I literally just started, I started reading that book last night. All oh, right. First chapter, that's why the author's name was so perfect. First chapter is sensational, but yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a bit, so far, so good, but... Um, yeah. Like elite athletes are known for not attending... Uh, Elite athletes, athletes uh, yeah. weddings. Like but Roy, they, King, Roy King did the same. David Beckham didn't go. Didn't uh, go to David Beckham's wedding. No, I'm not Left surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised because <laughs> he wasn't world class enough. Maybe. Yeah, no, I was like, no. He didn't did did Beckham did Beckham make the pass to him? Who who made the bad pass? Or was his own bad yes, first Blanc touch? Just, yes, we're wrong. Yeah, it, it was Keane's fault. It wasn't a bad pass. It was Keane's fault. Um, yes, anyway, the sorry. Fault. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I just thought it was interesting that like you know the head coach who's won him all the yeah. rings and is still his employee and you know the thing, but he didn't show up or mm. maybe he wasn't invited or maybe maybe Surely he didn't no, go. Invited. Maybe he didn't go because he had work to do. You know. Yeah, he probably told him, "Don't bother inviting me." Don't bother inviting me because you know, so yeah, uh, you could say like it's a it's a waste of money. Yeah, but fair. like uh, work to do. I, I, like uh, the weddings are the reason for living. Like you know that's one of is, the reasons that you. Sorry, I, 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 I realize this is a uh, column specialist off the wall. Is, <laughs> is this how we got there? Because column is of the age. We're seven column of the of the age. As millennials, where marrying married around. Oh, oh, are you guys yeah. something to tell us? Yeah, <laughs> not it's quite. Not, not me just yet. It's not the reason for you. No, no. I mean that's not. Yeah, like, a bit, you were saying that's a bit better. Check work to do. A bit presumptuous there, Colin. Maybe it is it, on the horizon. Maybe, maybe you don't know about his private life. No, I do. <laughs> I mentioned him before I let him take the gig. Um, Belichick, like, maybe he was like, you know, I've worked to do, can't go, but like, oh, Billy, like, you need to be going to these events. To, like, these are yeah. seminal moments in life, but it's what it's worth. Now, having said that, I did attend a wedding in America, in Connecticut, about three years ago, and I was absolutely amazed because at midnight, do you know what happened? Everybody went home. Everybody left. Yeah. Uh, Everybody went home. And then uh, all the Irish were over because it was a half Irish wedding. Yeah. And we're like, what, is, what are you doing? Like the non-alcoholics went to, went to, went to the bar and uh, like it was like they had like a media PTSD. The bar staff they're like, what? What do you want? And it was like you know lads <laughs> ordering keep, like keep drinking <laughs> yeah. for like six hours. <laughs> the lads kept ordering and the, these people went, it's like but the wedding's finished. It was like, oh, it's only twelve. Yeah. Not going all the way to Connecticut for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had, they had so it was a mad um, a mad difference. They played games. Between meals, you had to pass stuff around the table ah. and you would get to keep the centerpiece if it landed on you and bring that home. It's yeah. tough enough with their lingus, like let's bring so, it yeah. home. But they made it a real kind of any living flowers. Maybe they were dead, were they? They were they were, they were dead okay. flowers, yeah. Well, but it was early kind of them. childlike, it was like we have to entertain our guests at all times rather than uh, I just leave you at it for the whole yeah. night. But um, you can't be doing that. Now. Twelve people. <laughs> they have guns. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not free wedding. Hey, I thought the matches last night weren't televised. Where did you watch it? Asks Aaron Kelly. Well, they're on Premier Sports. Premier, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the good matches behind the red button. Yes, but um, you know, I mean, you're in the YouTube comments. I suspect you might be able to find a match if you weren't looking for it. Uh, anyway, oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the WhatsApp number. We're we're burying the lead here. the The big snooker story is unfolding. There are multiple snooker stories from the Northern mm. Iron Open. There's a couple. There's a couple. The first one that kind of happened yesterday was uh, was Jimmy White losing. The, uh, some people said losing the rag. I, I actually don't really agree with it. So Jimmy uh, had a moment yesterday. He, he was playing Luca Brasell. He was three 0 down. It was the first of four. He ended up losing the, the match four 0 um, where you, you have to nominate a ball if, if there's any dispute as to which ball you're aiming for. Um, but now at this moment, Jimmy wasn't going to nominate a ball because it was going to be fairly obvious he was hitting the brown. But the referee just said br- uh, blue ball uh, and Jimmy re- replied brown and turned around and said something to the ref. The referee starts bursting bursting his whole laughing. Uh, Jimmy didn't see this as the point for him to start laughing because he's 3-0 down, he wants to concentrate. It was a big shot coming up, so he said, what's so funny, what are you laughing at? And deadpan serious, and everyone in the crowd is like kind of looking at the background and go, You think I'm here to amuse you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, so he, he really laughed. He, like properly ref, laughed. he properly burst out laughing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's Ben Williams is the referee, the Welsh guy, but uh, he kept laughing, and uh, Jimmy was like, What's so funny? And then uh, <laughs> basically, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of awkward at that. And then Jimmy just kind of raised his hand to him, it didn't do any any uh, rude gestures, but the referee gave him, a, gave him a warning. I think the referee felt a little bit embarrassed. Oh, I'd say a little yeah. bit threatened. Yeah. Hey, Spider, Spider, come and get me a drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The referee, I think, overreacted. Uh, Jimmy maybe <laughs> overreacted a little bit, um, but that was that was the first story yesterday. But then the next story: Aaron Hill, twenty years of age, Corkman. Um, a couple of years ago in the European Masters, beat Ronnie O'Sullivan, which was his his big win. Went on to kind of do nothing really since he hasn't. He hasn't. Uh, he's only got, twenty. He's only twenty, but he probably got overexcited with that win a little bit. Um, but this this win at the Northern Irish Open up in Belfast to the waterfront uh, last night. Joe Trump, number two in the world. Aaron Hill, by contrast, is number ninety five. Um, He's got Tom Ford up next, the next round. But this this win over Joe Trump, 
probably his biggest win of his career, 4-1 as well. Like Judd Trump was in the world final this year. Uh, he won this this tournament, the Northern Ireland Open, three years in a row between 2019 and 21, I think. Uh, but what made it great, lads, was the best example of sour grapes you're ever likely to hear. So Judd Trump was speaking, the interview lasted all of 37 or 8 seconds with uh, with Eurosport afterwards. The sourest of grapes from Judd Trump, because Aaron Hill did play really well, uh, but have a listen to how uh, disgusted Judd Trump was after the after the match. Judge, would it be fair to say you were up against someone tonight who was inspired by the occasion? Uh, not really. Um, no, I, I didn't feel like he played that well. There was, there was quite a few shots he, he got away with, so, yeah, disappointing. Is there something you feel you need to work on, or was it just an off night for you? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know what I did wrong. I mean, the, fir- the first frame, he flew two balls. The third frame, he played terrible safety, got away with it. And the, and the list goes on. So I missed I missed the ball in the last frame. Other than that, um, but he made a lot of mistakes and seemed to get away with every single one of them. Thanks for talking to us, Judd. Meow. Meow. He fluked balls. He played terrible safety. He didn't have a good game. Judd did not like losing to Aaron Hill, let me tell you. Because Aaron, Aaron gave, it, gave it loads afterwards. There was bus, it, yeah. bus loads coming uh, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was kind of he was getting emotional as well. His parents were in the front row. Um, oh, that's class. But it was he was really loving it, and he did an interview with Eurosport in the studio afterwards. And he was he's a real he's a real character, yeah. the corkest cork man you'll ever you'll ever hear, yeah. accent wise. Um, North later, very very Nari. strong. Nari. very good. But, yeah. uh, but it's just one of those accents. You're like Jesus. He is. There's no in this, in this, uh, there's no dispute as to where he is from. Um, but really really interesting guy. He started slagging his girlfriend as well on TV, saying, "Oh, she's over in America with her with her parents, and you know she could have blown out that holiday and come and supported me, but not. She decided to go off to the states." Uh, a bit tongue, he's a tongue in cheek kind of guy. He's uh, he's got a bit of character to him. <laughs> so, so how good is he? Like is he? Uh, he's very good. Um, you know, if, if you're beating Joe Trump in the form that Joe Trump is in in the last year or two, then you're, you're pretty good. Um, now I, the hope now, and Jimmy White said to him in studio afterwards, "Push on from here." So know. Jimmy White is also doing the comms, is he? He's doing a bit of punditry. He does a bit of com- comms as well. Right. Ronnie O'Sullivan is like Ron- Ronnie's not even Ronnie decided not to play in this tournament. He's over there in Belfast anyway, as hanging out, pundit, just hanging out. But did Ronnie uh, lead, leads a pretty Spartan lifestyle, no? Mm-hmm. Or is that just for the cameras? Is he actually out, uh, kind of? He, he's, he's down with all the students in the bot, is he? Well, he does whatever he wants. Like when he's in Sheffield, he lives on a barge. Um, he does what he wants. He does what he does. He does what he wants. Genuinely, he lives on a barge. He, uh, he lives on a barge. Yeah, yeah. Well, only for the two weeks of Sheffield. Two weeks Sheffield. But he enjoys like he likes running. He likes. Uh, he's obsessed now with running and with healthy food. Um, and he's left his kind of has a chain of lingerie shops. Yeah, yeah. Does he? So he's kind of, he's interesting backstory, Ronnie, obviously, but uh, there was a great documentary done in Eurosport in the last week or two. There's a two-parter. Um, I have to see the second part, but uh, an insight into the, the great man himself. His art collection is priceless. He's got a Damien Hirst. Yeah, Does he? Damien Hirst, a good mate of his. Yeah, he was asked recently, one of his um, one of his many wins, wins like, how are you going to celebrate tonight? And he was like, I'm going to treat myself with a gym session. It was like, very different, Ronnie, from the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very totally. different. So, I mean, Belfast, you know, great city. No reason not to visit. But not that much to do unless you're like going to the pubs. That would be yeah. a, that would be a point. You've maybe got the Titanic Quarter, I guess, to visit, and yeah, if you yeah. Want a little bit of tourism. That's in an there. hour, yeah. That's an hour done there. Uh, you could probably do those. What do you do with the rest of your day there, Shane? Do those cycling uh, beer things where you're. Yeah, all but he's not bearing. Oh, he's I mean, not bearing. Well, he likes the cycling aspect of it. That would be yeah. the treat for Ronnie. Well, maybe yeah, that yeah. Work out, you know. Get the beer, just cycle. Cycle out to the Carrick Road where, Bridge. Where did you fall on the ref reaction? Uh, with Jimmy White, yeah, uh, ref overreacted with the warning. Jimmy White, Jimmy, oh, he Jimmy warned just, him after the. He warned him. He, he lifted his at? hand. Yeah, yeah. Right. But he wasn't even. He wasn't warning him because he responded to the lift to the um, the laughing. It was more. Jimmy just lifted his hand and walked is there, walked away. Uh, is there anything to be said for a bit of levity, though? You know, he's just laughing. Just the game. Bit of levity. Bit of levity. But as Alan McManus and Ronnie said at, at the time, levity at good at the picker moments. Jimmy's right. three 0 down. He's on a pretty big shot. Uh, he needs to, you know, pot the brown, get up to the reds. So it's a pretty crucial moment of the yeah. game for Jimmy, and there's money on the line for him as well. And but you can't pick your moments when you're going to burst out laughing. That's why you've burst out laughing. As in, it's natural. The yeah. Hilarity. Yeah. Yeah. But you're the referee. Do you know, the, when when he said when the referee mistakenly nominated the blue, and then Jimmy said, yeah. "Oh, the brown." What the referee should have done was, "Okay, sorry, Jimmy, brown ball. Move on. Let's not let's not laugh." I mean, it wasn't really. And there's other games going on around him as well. I get where. Look. Yeah, snooker maybe needs characters, and, and that's where Aaron Hill comes in. But I think referees need to pick their moments in a game like snooker where the focus is so intense. I'd say a part of that's the nervous overreaction, is it? Uh oh. Well, yeah, like, yeah, afraid I was of Jimmy. That, I was thinking that, but I do think it was a very natural laugh. Mm. I, I had a bit of sympathy with him. Now, I do think, I think he totally overreacted afterwards, which is like, 
oh, I better discipline him here in some way because yeah, this is going to no get need. out of hand. Yeah, and yeah. I think if he had just said, all right, sorry about that, but I don't really blame him for the laugh. Like People laugh. Like people I mean, laugh. and now people are talking about it and it's good for the sport ultimately because here we are top of the show talking about snooker. Yeah, and that ref does it generally. Like he, he, I've, he's, I've seen him do that before where he kind of laughs and has a bit of fun with the game, which is which is normally I, I support fully, but I just thought at that, at that particular moment. But like Jimmy, I, like I've had experience. I remember sitting with Indrada with, with between Jimmy and Ronnie interviewing them before an exhibition and like, they're two of the. They're just characters. They're they're going to do that anyway. Yeah. Like some of the stories from Jimmy. Are like, have I you ever heard the that. story of of Jimmy's? Uh, I know I didn't bring this story up with him, but it's in his book, Second Wind, the story of his brother's wake. No. So his brother his brother died reasonably reasonably young. I can't remember what age he was when his forties or fifties maybe. Um, and Jimmy and and the family were at the wake, and. Jimmy got this bright idea. There was obviously maybe a, a, bit, a few substances taken that, that inspired this idea. Uh, decided they wanted one last session with the brother. So they brought so him. They, they, they broke into the, um, the uh, I guess, where, where they hold the body down in the fridges. Mortuary. The mortuary. And uh, they snuck down. Uh, Jimmy took the body, rang a taxi. And the, the couple of them were like, oh, this isn't a good idea, Jimmy. But they, they were going to bring it to his other brother's house and surprise the brother. Weekend at Bernie's. Weekend at Bernie's, essentially. And uh, the taxi driver was like, uh, sure, your mate's all right there in the back. He's a bit... Uh, Cold. A bit, a bit quite looking. And uh, Jimmy's like, ah, he's grand. He's just had a few drinks. They landed to the brother's door, rang the doorbell, and uh, the brother was like, what the hell are you doing? Well, it's just a good wake, isn't it? That's yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah. There is obviously, you know... They brought him into the brother's bar. They propped him up at the bar. They told some stories, and uh, they had him back in the in the fridge by... By the sunrise. So All right, okay. It was one of those. Uh, one of those not, stories you read in the book. You're like, what? They're, they're not great at the old death in England, are they? They, they it takes weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So and String it all out, and it's, it's, uh, it's a bit. Uh, it's a bit grim. I was getting grief yesterday if using the word grim, but that is grim. Yeah. Uh, there's a great story that he tells about, like, um, great story. There's a story that he tells about him when he's off his head on crack in uh, Kildare, playing in Goffs, yeah. where they're just holed up in the hotel room for three days, literally burning the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like <laughs> taking the furniture off, trying to use it to get more crack. You're like, ah, oh, here. And then he's just recovered totally to the point where he's now like giving out to referees and sitting doing commentary on your sport. Yeah, it's dead um, serious. Yeah. yeah. I remember uh, it, another story where the, his dog uh, went, went missing for days on end. And uh, Jimmy had a, a snooker table down in his shed at the end of his uh, big house. And uh, this dog went missing. And um, there, it, it, it transpired that a few days later they found the dog that, that was hash sitting on the, on the snooker table now Jimmy claims it was the, the gardener's hash or the cleaner's hash um, but uh, yeah the dog ended up tucking into the hash and was found under the table as, stoned. You, as you can imagine stoned off haven't eaten the whole thing yeah oh wow he ate the whole thing so uh, Pearl well, he's and, hanging out with Ronnie Wood wasn't he they, they had good times oh in there, yeah so. two Ronnie's good mates with Keith Richards yeah uh, um, <laughs> well as Massey Dines suggested in the comments this morning if Ronnie's over in Ireland get him on yeah, for I sure. Mean, we gotta, yeah, yeah, we gotta, we gotta get him on at some at some stage for sure. Uh, Isil Cody, good morning to you. Isil says uh, traveling this Friday to a New York half Irish wedding. The non Irish bride has booked a bar for afterwards, knowing her audience. That's the key. You got to know your audience. Manchester United tonight, yeah. big game against Spurs. Mm -hmm. What's the truth of where they are? Do we find out, or is this just like a long, slow, steady build to them being good next season? They're in a better place than what they were last season. I think Ralph Reinick ended up being the Nadir probably in the whole era since Alex Ferguson. Um, I have. I wanted Pochettino. I settled for Ten Hag. I was like, okay, well, I'll give this guy a go. Uh, I I think he's definitely good for the club. I'm on his side in decisions, like for instance, leaving Cristiano Ronaldo out of the team. I completely support that. I think Ronaldo looks. He he really labours through games when he plays. Like he just yeah. looks. He looks every bit his age at the moment. It's actually amazing the contrast between this season and last because Ronaldo was United's mm. best attacking player last season, top scorer, but he's really fallen off the fallen off the cliff in terms of performance and I think with Ronaldo if he doesn't score you goals now he's giving you absolutely nothing the complete opposite to what he was when he started off at Manchester United he just he's, he's almost a liability in the team in that way so I I understand completely what he's trying to do um, I don't really necessarily agree with the criticism of Anthony people are already calling him a bit of a one trick pony that he's predictable I know Skull said you know what he's going to do all the time but I think he's been one of United's better players he's scored a few crucial goals already mm. I would say where I am over Robbie United at the moment, I'd say it's a bit of a 6 out of 10 season so far. I'm not overreacting or getting too annoyed to poor results or performances. Manchester City, I accepted, which is probably a bad thing if you're a United <laughs> fan, that you accept getting hammered by your rivals um, that comprehensively. But I think that's where United are. Um, and overall, like Newcastle was disappointing, but they're kind of level with Newcastle in terms mm. of performance at the moment. I mean, I know last season you said you're... Newcastle could be fourth and I scoffed at the notion yeah. and I still think that United yeah. are the superior team by far but by that's far. kind of where we are with performances at the moment with tonight 
Against Spurs last season, United won 3-2, a Ronaldo hat-trick. Can't see that happening tonight. Conte has them playing so much better. It's Spurs' best start to a season since 1963-64 after right. 10 games. He has them so disciplined. He has them believing. I would have Spurs as favourites tonight, but I'd back Ten Hag and what he's trying to do to get something out of the game. Would you have them as favourites, Low Trafford? Yeah. I think the way Spurs are playing, I think he has them completely mm-hmm. believing. Like Any other iteration of Spurs, really other than the 2016-17 Pochettino side, mm. I don't think they're believing they're getting something. Even, th- even though the United teams haven't been good at Old Trafford or like, against Spurs in that fixture for a long time where they haven't been that dominant. Yeah. But I would say like Conte has Spurs playing more, more together than Ten Hag does United so far. So yeah. therefore for me, it's kind of, it makes sense that they're the favourites. I was looking at the, some of the scoring stats, like United, United 11th of the top scoring teams, of the top 10, only Bournemouth have scored less goals than them. Like Bruno Fernandes is one of those things where game to game now, I'm just like, well, when do we give up? When do we give up uh, faith in the man? Because he's got one goal in 13. In was he first, not playing well at the start of the season? He's no? playing reasonably well, but like in his first full season for United, he scored 28 goals. Now he's got one in 13 games. So look, he, he has leadership qualities as well, and he's been captain since Maguire hasn't been in the team. But I think he start he needs to start adding more goals to his game. Um, either either he does or Ericsson does or someone needs to needs to start adding because we're just not scoring goals. Manchester and the Rashford chance at the end of the Newcastle game. I mean, Manchester United you know, are slight favourites here, by the way. Just about. Really, yeah, the yeah, I'm surprised, yeah, I'm surprised that. Um, yeah, Bruno Fernandes wrecks my head. Yeah, I just he, like he, he just is gesticulating and some of the passes, the, the decision making. Like, yeah, look. So who, were, who's in the team instead of him, lads? Come on! I know you're still putting him in the team. Well, so I mean, that's the that's the problem, though, isn't it? Like, you could have the Brazilian pivot of Fred and Casemiro, which they did. The no, head. I'd have I'd have him in the out. team. I'd I'd have him in the team. I'm not saying I'm not. Can you not team. play all three? Really, I'm not anything to do. His demeanor, uh, it just jars me sometimes. And I actually said that at the peak of his form, yeah. that there's something about the way he handles himself on the pitch, which if he definitely if he, was, if he was an opposition player, I would target him to my ire. But I'm like, okay, look, he's been good to United, and I I won't forget what he did at. The first 12 to 18 months United, yeah. he was brilliant. He was probably was one of the excellent. only positives for a while. And he's fallen off a bit since Ronaldo joined the club, really, since the start of the last season. He's not the same player. And I think then his uh, negative aspects are kind of, there's, there's a light shot on them when he's not playing so well. Yeah, the other thing from a, from a Spurs perspective, it's the last game of Emerson's suspension. So Matt Doherty uh, will, will clearly be, be in action tonight. We'll find out maybe where Matt Doherty is after tonight when Emerson comes back. But Dan McDonald's a great piece in the Irish Independent today. And like he's talking about that whole Conte Doherty relationship. Every, all, of, all of us, ourselves included, were getting carried away by Conte's comments on, on Doherty as, as, oh, he hits Doherty. Uh, then you see him coming off the pitch at the weekend. Hugs all it's around. Tough love. That's what it, it is. That yeah, was in relation to Jed Spence as well. It was right backs in general. Yeah, at the club, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Doherty was one of the answers. Dan McDonald's written about that today. The Irish Independent. But he, Jed Spence. He when when Spence arrived, he's like, I didn't sign him. Or, Correct. I, I yeah, it's, him. It's, it's Spence is for, the issue here. Yeah. Like, if I was Doherty, I wouldn't be worried. If I was Spence, I'd be well, concerned. The trouble is, he doesn't change his fullbacks. So you you would be a little bit concerned about that. Um, yeah. But Dan Dan's point is that Conte or Doherty's personality type is someone that needs that tough love and that kind of relationship with Conte, which is maybe a fair point because hmm. uh, Doherty gets criticised for being too laid back in interviews and even his demeanour on the pitch and stuff as well. But um, you know, maybe a fire up his ass from from Conte's comments and uh, it seems to have worked because he played well the last day out. All right. OTBM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. It will be magnificent. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> I think columns will be fantastic. You'll both be grand. I'm, just, I, I'm actually sitting here um, much of the last 20 minutes thinking, well, look what I go for. Mm. Probably the stubble underneath the tash. Can you do that? Yeah. That's okay, isn't it? I mean, it's not really. It is. Like, it's then it's the a beard. Is prominent. The then most prominent part of the facial hair has to be the mustache. But then it's a I beard. I think you can do anything I else mean, then. You're, you're certainly, <clears throat> you're, you're like stretching the bounds of what's acceptable. I went for the, the, the Narcos, Narcos DEA agent kind of 85 yeah, yeah, the last yeah. time. So that's probably yeah. where, where I'll head with you <clears> if I do it. So Up next, we're going to be live in studio with the Irish Independence, Michael Verney. First, here's a snippet from a slight tangent on last night's show with Mick talking about Newcastle spending power. So, like, Pep Guardiola's won four league titles and he's done this, that, and the other. He's got 100 points in a season. You know, he's starting on third base, you know, and he has to know that. But he'll be like, well, nobody else would have got those extra five points. Nobody would have won the four out of five. They would have won two or three. Mm. But 
it, it, it absolutely undermines it, you know, and they get so angry about it. And it's just, I didn't think Howe would be in that bracket. But look at him today, like, nonsense talk about, like, you know, we haven't, you know, okay, we spend a few uh, money, but we haven't spent the way people thought we did. It's like, because we had that conversation. They, they, we thought they would buy stupidly. They still spend an awful lot. I mean, they spent 240 million in two transfer windows. Yeah, I think so. It's I the so idea that Newcastle aren't spending the money is absolute I propaganda. I saw, f- I, again, f- uh, Philippe Claire was tweeting it just before. Beforehand we came in, I'm pretty sure he said that the highest net spend uh, in the year that's gone yeah. in 2022 or whatever. Like okay. things, like it's it. You know, they're spending lots, but they're just not buying Rubinho. Yeah, yeah, it's like we we've huge plans and we want to go places with huge ambitions. But the reality of what we're working towards and working with, there is a ceiling because of all the things I've said here and explained every week. Financial fair play. We're still in a training ground that is being renovated. <laughs> Financial fair play is nonsense. Your renovated training ground has nothing to do with anything. He doesn't have a third example. Mm. There is no ceiling to Liverpool or to, to Newcastle. There might be a, a, a temporary one, a uh, you know, a, 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 a sheet. Well, then you get to the, <laughs> yeah, you get to the point as far as stopping the rain getting in. That's well, it, a city like. or a PSG where you it, like you get to a point where you put yourself right firmly amongst the elite, but you can't necessarily buy beyond that point, as has been as was demonstrated so far. Mm. So you can't go and buy the Champions League as such. I mean, you're, you're there there about you giving yourself incredible odds, but like if you want to talk about a ceiling but it's nonsense like yeah, you're saying to win football matches but that's like yeah you know, it's, it's just it's, it's nonsense but even look at the evolution they're signing where they're signing Isaac by comparison to Chris Wood last year they've already started to step it up oh, yeah. at this stage yeah. and, of course, and of course they have and I mean like their fans would be fuming if they didn't and like that's understandable but we can give out about Eddie Howe and rightly so I mean it's, that's like idiotic comments I would say and like Guardiola I think in the same boat the, the problem I have and I, I sorry to repeat myself because I was talking a bit about this in the news round is again that we're having this conversation on a level that treats what everybody is saying as the same. You know, it's like, oh, well, Klopp has a fair point there because that is true. Oh, but, you know, the Newcastle, they, they haven't spent the way we thought we would, you know. So it's, it's been very measured. You have to say they're doing a good job. It's like, that's an irrelevance. You know what I mean? The, 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 the how they're spending the money is not relevant to the conversation of whether... A, a, an oil state should own a football club. Mm. You know, and it's just, I don't know, it's just this... Er, this Obsession with giving both sides of every argument False that just so frustrating. Mm, yeah. False equivalence is the exact term, yeah. Two minutes past eight this morning. You're very welcome back to OTBAM. That was the lads from a slight tangent last night. You can get that podcast on the OTB Daily podcast feed, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I'm delighted to say Michael Verney is with us. Michael, good morning to you. How are you? Yes, how are you? Uh, we've set you um, an interesting slash difficult task of um, talking about some of the best players you've played against. This is kind of inspired by. The couple of conversations that have happened recently, specifically around Bally Hale, the notion that Colin Fenley isn't finished as an intercounty hurler is one very interesting thing. It's like the, just the little balloon has been floated. He said he fell out of love with the game. He's back in love with the game. He's only 33. He's been dominating. Um, New manager. You know, somebody might decide that uh, they, they like the cut of his jib, that he's got a very specific role he could play. You know, he certainly, he really let himself go as well. That's noticeable. <laughs> <laughs> um and then also just the fact that TJ Reid is the GOAT. Uh, the source of that being Eddie Brennan is very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. I was only thinking, like, Eddie has, Eddie has played with probably four to five and many more of the best players of all time in DJ, Henry, TJ, Tommy and JJ. They would be the first five that would come to mind. So for him to put TJ right yeah. at the head of that conversation, I think is quite significant. Yeah. Recency bias or potentially, um, but it's just like if you look at it, since TJ was TJ was dropped for the 2012 All Ireland quarter final against Limerick, and he was having conversations with Henry about whether he was going to you know stay going at Inter County, and look at the last ten years, it's been absolutely unbelievable. And the longer he goes, it seems the better he gets. Mm. Um, like he was, he's nominated for Hurler of the Year this year, lads. He's 35 next month. He was brilliant last Sunday. And the 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 more club runs, the I I I'll put it this way: Henry was unbelievable on an unbelievable team. To me, it's more significant to be unbelievable on a lesser team and to be dragging a lesser team with you. Yeah. That's my opinion. Anyway. Yeah, no, I can I can see how that certainly makes helps make the case. Um, it's like the, just the fact that it's as you say he's played with all these lads. Um, that really. Makes you kind of go, okay, well, if he thinks that, that's kind of important. Well, he started a nice debate for us all anyway. There's yeah, plenty of, yeah. of conversation now with anyone. In the off-season. So we, we were asking you, who are the best players at the split season? Let's, let's split this into club and, and county. Um, 
who are the best players you played against at club level and who are the best players you played against at county level? Yeah, um, club level would be first anyway. Uh, there was probably three to four that, that kind of sprung out. The first one I would have is uh, Joe Brady from Coolary and Offaly. Now, I marked him a couple of times when I ended up up the other end of the pitch. Uh, he was centre-back for Coolary. But here's a guy who... Can you give us an era, sorry, for, for people yeah, who are wondering? Yeah, he, no. he would have only finished playing for Coolary in the last couple of years. He would have played, definitely played senior with Coolary probably from 2002 to 2000 and. He scored a winning goal in the 2015 county final okay, for Kildare right. when pushed up full forward. But here's a guy who was probably shouldn't have been hurling. He needed, I think, double hip replacement. And he was centre back and he was literally unstoppable at times. You just you put the ball anywhere down around that 45, 65, the hand goes up, you get denied, the ball comes back down. Just an unbelievable leader. I think if you chatted to, to Brian Carroll or Damian Murray or any of the Coolary lads, they would tell you that Joe Brady was the heartbeat of Coolary. And he absolutely maxed out his own career, I would say, particularly taking into account those injuries. But when I stand in corner back and you're looking up at this guy's centre back and he's in the mood, you're kind of thinking, how are we going to get around him? Yeah. That sort of player. So, um, it's just like you're kind of you're not directly facing him on the pitch but you're kind of yeah. he's like you're, a force field that drags everything kind, kind of yeah, yeah. and um, while there are near neighbours and are uh, bitter enough rivals he had you know when they went on that club run and got to the All Ireland final in 2012, like he was outstanding the whole way. He was the one that really, really drove them forward. So he would definitely, definitely be up at the top or in around the top of my club list anyway. Uh, Damien Hayes would be next. Um, had the misfortune of marking him in a club final in 08. Um, and you know the way people talk about you know the dimensions of pitches and whether pitches are bigger than others I can categorically tell you that Crow Park is wider than any other pitch in the country because I remember him getting a ball and I remember shepherding him towards the sideline and you're thinking you know you know in your head the dimensions of the pitch you've played on pitches your whole life and there was another 10 yards there and I just <laughs> said oh no and this, he just ran straight and just took took away and you could see the dust the road runner just coming after but uh, obviously at county level he had a brilliant career with Galway but at club level and as part of that brilliant Portumna team like he, he was nigh on unstoppable at times as well not particularly big probably about 5'8 just so fast so powerful and again another guy who got so much out of himself particularly I would say obviously he had a brilliant county career but at club level uh, you know, the likes himself, Chunky Hayes, uh, Ollie Canning, obviously Joe Canning as well. Not a bad team. Not a bad team at all, yeah. Not a bad, but he was just, he was so hard to stop. He got 1-3 in that, in that final. Yeah, I don't, think he got, I don't think he got most of that off me now, to be fair. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and he ended up on his brother Kevin uh, at one stage in it as well. But um, <laughs> Not that anybody's counting, you know. Quick retraction. Yeah. There. Yeah, wasn't yeah, me. Yeah. I actually wasn't marking him at I, all. I hate that when it, when it looks like, um, it just looks like 13 was marking 4 and 13 got 1-3 and it's, like, it, I think it's more fluid now because people realise they switch at different stages. But uh, yeah, just that make, was bring that up though. Just make sure in case anybody, you know, <laughs> just, just just on that as well. After uh, he skinned you, they moved him off you. Yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> Padre Whelan was our manager, and um, Padre would be, you know, one of the great club managers. If we're talking about club managers or goats as regards club managers, Padre would probably be it. But that was my first club final, and he came on to me on the pitch after. And Lean Power, I was after chatting Lean Power, club legend. It was going to be his last time ever playing senior for Bor and Lean was after saying, "Is this the?" last time I'd be up here and I nearly had a tear in my eye myself and Padre just comes over to me I hadn't seen him since the, ma since the match had ended he just come over put the arm around me and just said pass you by Vern and I was just like <laughs> thanks oh. Padre <laughs> but uh, that, that's, that's, that's the way it was right, yeah. that's tough love yeah tough love alright yeah tough love alright uh, but that was, a, that was a tough afternoon alright yeah yeah the other, I mean, yeah, it's okay to have. Is that not like that's brutally honest though? You'd be thinking about that for a couple, for a couple of weeks after. Well, to be honest, three years it, later, it was a bit. Of, it was <laughs> yeah. well, like there's some great Padre stories that I, that I couldn't tell on air. That's one that I could tell on air. But um, <laughs> I actually was thought I was in the, probably in the top five of the lads that played for Borough that day. But sure, listen, he obviously he obviously thought different. I mean, you might have been that. It's just that Portumna team were so amazing, isn't it? Yeah, we actually got a great start that day. Um, but they were on a, they were on another planet. Joe was actually quiet enough that day. And but Andy Smith was the one that really stepped up. He got two two that day, and we were well beaten in the wind up. We were talking there about Matt Doherty maybe maybe needing the tough love from uh, from Antonio Conte a couple of weeks ago. You you must have been one of those players that needed the needed the tough love, and Padre knew that. Not really. No, there's tough love, and there's tough like tough love after an All Ireland final. Like you're building me up. I would have appreciated an arm around the shoulder. Yeah. Like um, yeah. I, there are players that need it, but 
Um, it's, but some managers know that they can say anything to certain individuals yeah. and they'll keep coming back. Whereas, you know, if you said that to somebody else, they'd probably get discouraged maybe, you know. Yeah, but I was, yeah. I was probably always going to keep coming back anyway, uh, yeah, just yeah. a pig for hardship. <laughs> uh, okay, so Damien Hayes is second on your list. Uh, this, the strength is the other thing, like the, the speed and the strength is combined. That was um, good, uh, like just a great eye for goals and big games as well. Like always stood up for Galway in those matches when the rest of the team was down as well. So yeah, that's a good sign. Who's your third one? Uh, Owen Reid would be the third one. Owen Reid from Ballyhale. So he actually didn't play last Sunday, but he picked up his 11th Kilkenny Senior Hurling Championship medal along with TJ and along with Colin. I was chatting to Jackie Tyrrell about this last week and he said when they were playing, uh, when they were playing the Shamrocks, you know, did they tag Henry, they tag TJ Reid, they tag Cha, and then Owen Reid would hit you for one three. He was that type of player, maybe didn't get as much attention because there was bigger names around him, and obviously he's TJ's older brother, but just uh, an unbelievable club man. I think he has, um, I think he has all Ireland's at every level. Minor, 21, senior, colleges, club, I think he has a Fitzgibbon as well okay. with, w, uh, with WAT. He's one of these guys that probably floats under the radar somewhat, but just an unbelievable talent. Lovely left side. Um, always delivers and is still delivering now. He must be must be 37, probably going on 38 now, but just an unbelievable club player. Played a bit with Kilkenny and was in around squads. Remember him starting the Leinster final one year, but an unbel- like probably uh, not the epitome of a club player, but just an unbelievable club player. A player that who absolutely excelled at club level and is, is, is uh, still excelling now. Mm-hmm. You would have been marking him directly? Yeah, marked him in a Leinster semi-final, actually, in 07, when we beat them, actually. But... Um, he was the sort of player that, and I'd probably talk about this when I move on to one of the county players, he's the sort of player that if you are thinking about your own game and getting on the ball and trying to get on the ball and have an impact on the game, he'll just skin you for two or three points. Right. He's the sort of lad that you have to keep that razor focus on. If you give him, it's like Patrick Horgan, if you give him half a yard, it'll just be a little flick of the wrist and it'll be in the back of the net or over the bar. So he was a guy that you had to keep. If you kept close tabs on him, uh, you probably wouldn't touch the ball and he wouldn't either. But if you wanted to go and hurl loads of ball that day, Grand, you'd hurl loads of ball and he'd hit you for four points probably. Were you always a cornerback at the start? Like you, uh, you, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much still now. Maybe moved over to fullback playing. We were the senior B team in Burr now. But yeah, all was in there for my sins, yeah. Right. When you talk about Owen Reid being really good off his left, like, do you have time during a match to be thinking about that and actively thinking, right, let's get him on his right? Not that his right was any weaker, but when you know someone is really strong off a particular side, is that consciously in your head during a game or is just too much happening that it's not really a, a thought, I guess? No, it would be if a guy is predominantly one-sided. Um, you know, you'd always say even when you're coaching a team, at least, you know, show him to the other side and if he's going to score make him score off his weaker side so no it would be something and you try and get it ingrained in you the only problem there is uh, Owen Reid would have been fast now he wouldn't have been maybe as fast as a Damien Hayes yeah. whereas you know if Damien is one side and you show him to one side and you're shepherding him there then he can skin you for pace on the other side whereas you know if a fella is one, if one, uh, somewhat one sided and maybe doesn't have the pace to skin you as much you can probably shepherd him maybe a bit more should I say yeah. but if he has pace and he's one sided and you keep showing that one side and he shows a, a sidestep and he goes the other side then you've overcommitted and then you're in trouble rather than giving away a point potentially giving away a goal I suppose mm. uh, Okay so there are the club players what about the county players? Well there's only one man to start with and that's uh, John Milan so my worst experience on a hurling field is marking John Milan we played them in a qualifier in 08 uh, down in Turles, um and we had beaten Limerick the week before in a qualifier down in the Gaelic grounds probably uh, if you asked a lot of the Offaly lads, lads it's probably their best moment hurling them Offaly they were beating all Ireland finalists the year before I was marking Andrew Shocknessy kept him quiet enough by you know by his standards I think he scored a point or whatever fell in kind of sleepwalked sleepwalked into the week after and it's amazing how games can be so different you could be playing corner back and the ball mightn't come near you for the first 10 minutes Within 10 seconds, the ball was in Milan's corner. I had fallen and he'd got he'd a point on the board. And already you're thinking, oh, I'm not on it today or whatever. And I, I wasn't and he was. And uh, I was gone after about 25 minutes, I'd say. Right. Yeah. And uh, the fellow who came on for me, uh, he was he was subsequently taken off as well. Okay. It was that. <laughs> Milan was on form. Owen Kelly was on form. Owen McGrand, the other corner, was on form. But it was just the pace. The pace of Milan, and you were talking with Shane, like he's a player, he, John would even tell himself he's predominantly left-sided, yeah. um, but he just had that pace where he could absolutely burn you as well. 
uh, and he burned me a couple of times at the. I think we were surprised in the crappy quiz last week. It was in the numbers round where Milan had five, was it five, five all stars. Yeah. Uh, yeah, none of us. You just kind of forget that. Yeah, like, yeah. It was a three, picture. three and four years under Davy, I think, and one before that. Like right. the tail end of his career was where he'd gotten to that level of experience, and his performances were just that an eight out of ten nearly yeah. every day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an intoxicating mix of um, pace and determination, and I'd say strength as well. Maybe. Oh yeah, without a doubt. And the funny thing is, like, it's amazing how the wheel turns. So, like, I'd work with John regularly in the Irish Independent now, and I've said it to him a couple of times, and he'd always kind of laugh it off and say, "Ah, oh, you were a tough old cornerback." So uh, one tough it up anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, at least he's like, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, at least he does remember. I yeah, it would be yeah. it would be very uh, deflating if he didn't remember. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the next would be um, Richie Hogan. Okay, so there's a couple of a couple of links in this. So I remember marking Richie at college's level and doing okay off him, and then I marked him in a a Leinster minor semi final. It was a couple of weeks after the leaving cert, and I hadn't prepared for the leaving cert at all. The first the first of the three leaving certs I did, by the way, and uh, <laughs> I I couldn't sleep at night during the leaving cert because I'd no preparation done, and it's like getting ready for a match if you haven't the prep done yeah. you're probably going to be real nervous I remember losing a lot of weight during the leaving cert about a stone or that just sweating at night and pressure and whatever and I kind of knew I was going back but that didn't take the pressure off and we played Kilkenny that sounds miserable by the way yeah it's not It's not. it wasn't nice yeah. right. it's, it's, it wasn't nice and that kind of fed into playing Kilkenny in this minor game was underweight probably um not, it wouldn't have the same energy. I built up this game to be like the biggest game. I remember saying to someone before, and like, this, this is a career defining game yeah, yeah, at yeah. minor level. It's like yeah. ridiculous stuff. And it was Mark and Richie, and uh, I'll never forget as I'm staring out the camera here, I was standing here, and he was coming in at me with the ball. And he threw his famous patented dummy hand pass because he was a big handballer with his right hand. And I literally moved into another parish. I was gone completely into another parish and he just walked through on goal. And funnily enough, Ray Murray, who was in goals, actually fell for the dummy hand pass as well and went to the other side of the goals. <laughs> so he literally just tapped the ball into, a, into an empty net on one side. Um, and then, funnily enough, I ended up marking him in his uh, inter-county debut right. in 08. Now, that was a different type of experience because I kind of you feel like you had a point to prove or something like that. So it was literally just mauling and wrestling with him for an hour. That's quite what it was. And when he went off, who came on to make his inter-county debut? Only TJ in the, in the same game. So it's, wow. a, it's a nice thing to have 14 years later when you're talking about TJ has been one of the greatest of all time that at least you marked him on his debut. But Richie was the sort of player, same as Owen Reid, that if you were focusing on anything but stopping him getting the ball, he would just crucify it yeah. completely. And so I remember just rolling around and mauling them all on the ground. And when the ball wasn't near us, you'd nearly just jump on him and take him to the ground or whatever. And mad kind of stuff like that, just to stop him getting the ball. It's a real pity that injuries have robbed us of the last four or five years of uh, his yeah. career, because I think he'd be in that same conversation with everybody else. If when you think about what he could do, he could play in the inside forward line and score a rake of points, but also kill you with his finishing. But then he could also drift out to centre forward and become a playmaker. And then he could also play midfield. Yeah. Which is the versatility that not all the rest of those players that we were talking about, and that obviously um, both JJ and, and Tommy do have that versatility. But the forwards didn't. Like they were inside forwards, really. Mm. Chef and maybe actually probably. I'm talking against myself. Here. Eddie won't like that now. Eddie, Eddie had one of his golden moments when he was out centre forward in 11 before he retired as well. Remember he set up Richie's goal yeah, yeah, hurrying yeah. down the field. Yeah. But Richie had that flexibility anywhere from 8 to 15, realistically. And if you wanted to play him centre back, you probably could and yeah. he probably will end up playing there at club level. Uh, and Dane's fourth are in an intermediate final at the weekend in Kilkenny actually against Thomastown. But had he not had those crippling back injuries, it just, like, it's mad to think the last two years had Kilkenny not gone to extra time against Cork, he wouldn't have played in 2020 and his first bit of action this year was in the All-Ireland final when he came on yeah. and you're thinking it's the dream scenario he gets a point uh, and you're thinking it could be that kind of fairy tale ending but he's, it's those bit part cameos that he's been reduced to yeah, unfortunately which is really unfortunate because he definitely still seems to have uh, he obviously has the experience to be able to get involved in games at that level Um Okay, so that is that your third? Like, that, that's, your third? Uh, that's two. Uh, my my third one has actually escaped escaped me for the moment. Um, <laughs> oh must, yeah, I was just saying you must get leave insert PTSD. A lot of people get those June nightmares, the recurring nightmares of the of the leave insert. But you probably have them combined <laughs> with Richie Hogan selling you the dummy. I mean, it, that must be a tough <laughs> tough period of the year for you. This is the for, like, the, like, June was the, the like, this is the first kind of leave insert I can remember that I didn't have this recur. I do have a recurring. Really? It's not just around the leave insert. It's just like. It's this thing of the dream is that you're back doing the leaving cert, 
but you think you know it all, so you haven't prepared as much, and you're going to get less points than you got the year before. And that's that's the dream. That's the part of it. That and the other recurring dream is the hurling dream, where the game is thrown in and you just cannot. You're in the dressing room and you cannot get your boots on. You just you're like <laughs> just can't just can't get them on, and the ball is thrown in, and they're like, "Where's the corner back? Someone is standing in there by himself." So yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. Those yeah, those leaving sort dreams are a bit mad. All right, so, yeah. therapy session this morning. I can say, <laughs> Jesus, this is um, this got deep quick. <laughs> One last thing, very quickly, and um, we're nearly out of time this obviously deserves a much better uh, conversation off the off the cuff yesterday mm. um Shane had a theory about uh the small town the small town clubs or even the the kind of parish clubs holding their own certainly this is happening in Monaghan against the town clubs and all the town clubs or the big yep. town clubs are all struggling in Monaghan somebody texted in uh, saying that they're with an, an underage team in Kildare and they constantly beat the bigger town teams that I think your theory is that it's about identity. Yeah, because like, Carrick McCross and Castle Blaney were both relegated from senior to intermediate this year and Mon and Harps, the Mon and Town team, literally stayed in intermediate by the scuff of their neck, relegated mm-hmm. from senior nearly t- to junior this year. Uh, so it, there, there must be something in that. Uh, I tell you what, at, at, uh, with clubs, uh, rural clubs in particular, there's a thing where there's nearly a pride in not letting anyone fall off. Mm. They do not want to let anyone. They fall call off. to your house if you miss training. Yeah, well, there you yeah. go. Kulderi would be a prime example. Um, in Offaly, they'd have great numbers. Definitely have three adult teams, potentially four, but they wouldn't let a lad slip away where at all possible because it's I suppose it's such a part of an identity within within the community. Whereas in town clubs, uh, there's more distractions. There's rugby. There's soccer. There's when you're young. There's girls, obviously as well. There's different things going on in that might take your mind off uh, GA or whatever. But if you look at like Ballyhale, like I know you read out yesterday, Shane. Ballyhale doesn't have Ballyhale has less members than mm. teams in Kilmacud and Nafina, yeah. but. You could count on one hand the amount of lads that they've let go. Yeah. Like Owen Reed is still playing. Everyone will stay playing and they'll stay they'll stay going. And there's a, I know it's, it's it's maybe it's a bit generic, but there's um, there's a pride within that as well of keeping everyone playing. And I remember chatting um, I remember chatting a fellow who had his kids in McKilmacud, and he just said like there's so many teams at underage level. How do you get to know anybody as well? Like just say you're in a college course with forty people for four years chance there you get to know everybody really well yeah. you have a tight knit kind of course if you're in a college course with 500 there's little groups here groups there yeah. people slipping off people dropping out maybe so just the tight knit nature of it um, don't go to UCD that's what I'm hearing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a UL man anyway so we we did what are we about 70 or 80 in our P class and we would have all been fairly tight or whatever but it's just it's more easy I'd say it's easier for people to slip away my third man was Patrick Horgan as well by the way oh yeah okay yeah because um, I remember marking him in a qualifier he was the sort of guy that would like I remember they said it about Shane Williams, the rugby player, like he'd find space in a phone box. He literally would. His wrists were that quick. Again, a, a lot of those great forwards, it's deny, deny, deny. Mm. Deny them the ball. If they get the ball, you're chasing their tail. Yeah. You need to deny them the ball. His his wrists are like nothing I've ever seen before. All right. That was brilliant, Michael. Thanks a million. Uh, Michael Verney there. If you want to give us your thoughts, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number or you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. During the ad break, you're going to hear from our own Kathy McNamee, Emma Byrne and Karen Duggan on the latest episode of the Koi Gig Pod discussing the issue of Katie McCabe playing too deep. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB is in association with Cadbury FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national team. We're back after this with News Talk's courts correspondent Frank Graney on the latest at the Regency murder trial. OTB Sports Rugby Hit Connacht last season Going to hit them again this season They are in the tougher section Once you could concede We finish 8th But miss out On Champions Cup I think it is Progressively getting more and more difficult To qualify for the Champions Cup You certainly can't take it as red And you certainly can't take it as red When you make a start like Memphis. Subscribe to the rugby stream On the OTB Sports app now And it's strange It's strange for me Because I know we speak about Katie. Katie can play left. I mean, she can, but I mean, you can't have her there. She has to play higher up the pitch. And I'm not just saying that because she's Irish. I am saying it because she is one of the best attacking players in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And then you've got, you, like against Leon, it's going to be interesting because I know she's going to be pinned back there. And it's a shame because I think she can be very dangerous. And I feel like Arsenal have a problem at the moment, not with Black Stenius, I think she's a great player, but with Viviana Medema because she wants to play a deeper role, but she's not as good there. I mean, no. why does she want to play there? She's not as good there. She's Does much she want better. to play there or is that where she's being played and she has to agree? No, I think, to I think she, 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 wants, to she wants to. I think yeah. she wants to play in she's that role. A lot. 
yeah, yeah the- I guess she want, thinks she'll be more involved in the game there but I mean just let little do that business in there and slip the passes into it. Why would you want to work back there? Just stay up and get all the glory. No, but in all fairness, like I have seen her playing in the false nine and she's very good, but that's not the same thing as starting in that number 10 position or deeper in midfield. It's not the same thing. I think she is an excellent false nine. And I think that's where she should be playing because for me, I haven't seen her. I know she's been scoring goals and I know people are talking about her, but to be quite honest, I still haven't seen a performance from Medema that I know she can give. And I think she looks frustrated as well. Even when Black Sinia scored the goal, she was straight over talking tactics to her about what's going to come next instead of kind of celebrating. She's, mm. I don't think she's fully happy with mm. how things are going. The thing is it her. could work. It could work for them. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think Black Stenius is one of the best at running into the channels as well. She absolutely destroyed Ireland in, in Tala that yeah. night doing that. I think if they p- kind of had that kind of plan of attack that if put it into the corners for Black Stenius and then Viv going into that number nine position, that could work. But at the moment, I don't think Viv's getting in that position enough. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Right, you're very welcome back. 087 9180. <clears throat> 180 is the WhatsApp number. OTBAM is brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent Mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. Now, Frank Graney is with us. Frank, good morning to you. How are you? Good. Good morning, Jerry. Um, so, uh, people, when we cover this story, people are like, oh, this isn't a sports story. But fundamentally, it is a sports story. This was a boxing event that happened at the Regency and it had a massive impact on the future of boxing in Ireland. And kind of uh, before that, the the authorities were like less and less willing to allow boxing to happen because of the gangland associations, which obviously reaches its apex at the Regency Hotel on the, the day that the, this murder happens. So what happened yesterday? Because it kind of felt like we've been talking about this trial for months and months and months, but yesterday was actually the first day that something really significant happened in court. Yeah, I think we've, you know, it's fair to say we've been talking about this case for years, almost seven years now since the Regency shooting. And yesterday was the opening tri- day of Jerry the Monk Hutch's murder trial. So the charge is put to Jerry Hutch. Um, He was extradited from Spain a little over a year ago to face this charge. Um, He challenged the jurisdiction of the Special Criminal Court to hear his case. So this is being heard before the Special Criminal Court. There's no jury. Um, Three judges will hear the facts of the case. They will ultimately decide on a verdict. Um, But yesterday, the charges put to him and he defiantly stood up and pleaded not guilty. So he is contesting the charge. And what happened after that then was the prosecuting barrister, Sean Gillan, gave the court, I suppose, an overview or a roadmap of the case that he intends to present over the coming months. You know, allegations were made against not only Jerry Hutch, because there are two others in the dock, albeit facing, you know, less serious charges. Um, and he then spent some time going through the case that he's going to hopefully, well, he hopes he will prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt over, over the coming months, time will tell. What are the central tenets of that case that, he's, um, that he laid out yesterday? Well, he gave us a background about what happened, the undisputed facts about what happened that day. As you mentioned, this was a boxing event at the Regency Hotel. It was the day before the actual main event was due to take place in the National Boxing Stadium, appropriately called the Clash of the Clans. This was a joint promotion between Frank Warren's Queensbury Promotions and also MGM, which we know was was co-owned by Daniel Kinahan and the boxer and Matthew Macklin. Um, so this was the way in for that event on the Friday evening, or on the Friday afternoon rather, because we heard that at about two o'clock in the afternoon, um, a silver Ford Transit van pulled up outside a security gate adjacent to the hotel. Two men then were seen entering the laundry room entrance of the hotel. One of them was wearing a wig and dressed as a woman. Um, A witness yesterday afternoon um, gave evidence of seeing this person inside the suite where the weigh-in was taking place. And he said that there was no way you would think this was a woman. It was clearly a man. The other person then who entered through that laundry room entrance was wearing a flat cap. And he was described through the opening address yesterday simply as flat cap. We now know that 
was a man called Kevin Murray, a dissident Republican who has since passed away. He was one of the suspected gunmen on that day. Uh, Sean Gillan, in his opening address, told the judges that they would see CCTV footage that would show these two men moving through the hotel, moving towards the suite where the weigh-in was taking place. They were armed with handguns. Um, there were about two to 250 people there. We heard from a witness yesterday. Panic ensued. People fled for their lives. People died for cover. Um, at about 2.29 p.m. then, we heard that the van that was parked outside the security gate moved to the front of the hotel. The side door opened. We heard three men armed with assault rifles and dressed as Gardaí entered the main entrance of the hotel. While all this was going on inside, the van then did a U-turn outside the hotel. It pointed back in the direction from which it had come. The side door of the van remained open throughout everything that unfolded within, within the hotel. Shots were fired. Um, and David Byrne ultimately lost his life. And Sean Galan told the judges yesterday that they'll hear evidence that um, of uh, CCTV, CCTV evidence would be shown of David Byrne leaving the suite, running towards the reception area. Uh, one of the armed men described yesterday as Tactical One shot him. A man called Tactical Two also shot him. Uh, David Byrne went down and um, we heard that Tactical Two then hopped the desk. There was a man hiding behind the reception desk um, cowering, you know, hiding from the attackers. The gun was pointed at him for a moment, but Tactical 2 didn't open fire, went back over the desk, walked coldly and calmly over to David Byrne and shot him in the head and body. Um, David Byrne was shot six times. He died at the scene. We heard two other men were shot at the scene, um, but they were uh, treated for non-fatal or life-threatening injuries. Now, where does Jerry Hutch come into all of this? As I mentioned, he's been charged with murder. And for the first time yesterday, Sean Galan outlined the specific allegation in relation to Mr. Hutch. There are two strands to it. So earlier this week, I'm sure you're very familiar with the case of Jonathan and Patrick Dowdall. Jonathan Dowdall, a former Sinn Féin councillor, was sentenced to four years for facilitating what happened at the Regency Hotel that day. His father, Patrick, got two years for the same charge. They essentially made a hotel room available to the criminal organisation behind this attack. And what Mr. Galan is going to try and prove beyond a reasonable doubt over the coming months is that the night before the shooting, Jerry Hutch met with Jonathan Dowdall and those key cards were handed over to him. Um, Mr. Galan said that he will present evidence that those key cards were then used by Flat Cap, one of the, the gunmen. Um, and also we heard about a meeting that took place sometime after the shooting. We heard this was a meeting between Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall in a park in Whitehall in Dublin, where Jonathan Dowdall will say that Jerry Hutch was edgy um, and that he told him Again, this is an allegation that he was part of the team that shot David Byrne. We also heard that evidence would be presented about a car journey that they took to Straban on the 7th of March 2016. The car was bugged. It was under surveillance. Um, recorded conversations will be played in due course. And Mr. Glan said yesterday that Jonathan, Howdall, Jonathan Dowdall and Jerry Hutch could be heard discussing the feud with the Kinnahans, discussing what happened at the Regency Hotel, related matters, the possibility of a ceasefire. These were all recorded and again, they will be presented as evidence in due course. So <clears throat> the understanding is that that was booked by the, the Gardaí, was it? It wasn't said okay. specifically yesterday. <clears throat> All that the judges were told yesterday was that this car was under surveillance and there were recorded conversations of what the two men talked about while driving towards Straban. And this was, according to Mr. Galan, on the back of a request from Jerry Hutch to Jonathan Dowdall to make contact with his Republican contacts uh, in the north in the hope that they could bring some sort of an end to the ceasefire because Mr. Galan said that Jerry Hutch was apparently very concerned about his family's safety. And this was in light of a photograph, a very famous infamous photograph that I'm sure we've all seen that appeared on the front page of the Sunday World after the shooting and this was of Flat Cap and the man in drag uh, entering the hotel. Um, Jerry Hutch, according to Jonathan Dowdall in, in Mr Galan's opening address yesterday, he said that he was concerned about his family's safety in light of that photo being published. Okay, so the, the, the implication is that the, the photograph would have been identifiable to 
um, the rival gang and they would have acted on the basis of that photograph. Yeah, again, yesterday was just an overview. So, you know, Mr. Galland didn't delve into the, the details. Um, if Jonathan Dowdall is going to take the stand and he has indicated his willingness to do so, you know, he will be asked about um, that evidence. He will give more detail. But yesterday, you know, wasn't actually evidence. I mean, everything that I've described to you there wasn't evidence for the court to consider. It was just essentially a roadmap. Um, That's the narrative that the prosecution lays out. Yes, that they will have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, and um, in terms of the defence, when do you start hearing from the defence about it? it like how do, the Special Criminal Court is, is not something that we are privy to that often. It's been, I think it's been a while since a, a trial of this magnitude was heard there. So um, in terms of the procedure, how, does it work exactly the same as a, a normal jury court? Exactly the same. The only real difference is the fact that there isn't a jury you know, in the ordinary courts before the Central Criminal Court, where I would mostly ply my trade, um, cases are decided by 12 men and women, you know. Um, and as I mentioned, Jerry Hutch did challenge the jurisdiction of the Special Criminal Court to hear this case, but the Director of Public Prosecutions felt that the ordinary courts where, you know, a jury would decide the fate of an accused person were inadequate to deal with this case. You know, and in general terms, I mean, the court... The court was set up back in the day to deal with cases of terrorism, terrorist organisations. But there are two special uh, criminal courts nowadays, and that's because they're so busy dealing with gangland cases right. and, and organised crime. So in terms of the defence, I mean, Jerry Hutch has pleaded not guilty to this charge. He, like anybody else that pleads not guilty to a criminal offence, is entitled to a presumption of innocence. He doesn't have to prove his case. It's up to Sean Galan and his team to prove his case beyond a reasonable doubt. His barrister, Brendan Grant, doesn't even have to cross-examine witnesses. Um, but he did so yesterday when a witness was, was called in the afternoon. And you would imagine over the coming months he will pose you know, certain questions to certain witnesses. Jonathan Dowd will probably be a number one priority when he's called later in the trial. OK, um, you, you say months. It's like, uh, this is not going to be a short trial at all. No, um, um, probably because of, I suppose, the the complexities of the investigation and, and also the fact there are two others in the dock beside Jerry Hutch that have barely got a mention over the past couple of days. Uh, two Dublin men in their 50s, Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy, and they're both facing the same charge. They're accused of facilitating the murder by making certain vehicles available to the criminal organisation. We heard a lot of detail about the movements of those vehicles and that will be thrashed out in court. CCTV evidence, I've no doubt, will be presented in relation to five or six vehicles. They are being accused of providing two vehicles in, in particular, a black BMW and a, and a Toyota Avensis, a taxi. It's going to take three months and Brendan Grehan, um, who is defending Jerry, Much, as I, Jerry Hutch, as I said earlier, uh, he gave the court an indication as to whether or not the trial was likely to finish up before Christmas. He said he was hopeful, but it was more likely that it would probably go into the new year. So it is going to be a long one. How, okay. how significant, Frank, is Jonathan Dowdall's willingness to testify? Because, of course, it puts um, questions over his own safety. I know his, his, his own sentence is due to start in a couple of weeks, but significant that he is willing to speak at this trial. We don't know the significance at this point because we don't know precisely what he's going to say. Now, we did get a flavour of what he's going to say yesterday, specifically in relation to this alleged meeting between him and Jerry Hutch in Whitehall in Dublin, where Jerry Hutch is again alleged to have said that he was a part of that team that shot David Byrne. Now, that wasn't a recorded conversation. The conversation in the car apparently was recorded. The car was under surveillance and those recordings would be played to the court. So if that evidence is going to be presented by the prosecution, it will be through the testimony of Jonathan Dowdall. Now, when Jonathan Dowdall was sentenced earlier this week and Jonathan Dowdall was initially charged with murder, by the way, um, he pleaded guilty to that lesser charge of facilitating the murder by booking that hotel room at the Regency that was accepted by the DPP and they're no longer pursuing the prosecution in relation to the murder charge. He is in protective custody at the moment. He has been assessed for the witness protection programme, but he has indicated his willingness to testify. And at his sentence hearing, his defence barrister described this evidence as having a hard currency value. But again, that will ultimately be for this newly constituted special criminal court, Ms. Justice Tara Burns is presiding over it. You know, if Jonathan Dowdall does give evidence and the defence will be given an opportunity to cross-examine him if they so wish, it will ultimately be up to the judges to decide on the credibility, the relevance, the accuracy of his evidence. Uh, Daniel Killian was obviously <clears throat> the main target on the day of the, of the Regency. Is that 
generally accepted? Um, it wasn't said yesterday, <clears throat> but what they did say yesterday was that it was clear that this wasn't a random attack. This was sophisticated. It was organised by a resourced criminal organisation. And Mr. Galan did say yesterday that um, the impression they got from CCTV footage was that the armed men were looking for somebody. Um, there was mention of somebody leaving the hotel unharmed, escaping through the car park that was mentioned. But Daniel Kinahan's name wasn't mentioned at all yesterday. The only reference to the Kinahan's was in relation to the feud. Right. And we'll hear from a senior guard who will outline, I suppose, the background in relation to that feud, the structures of the various criminal organisations involved. Uh, MGM was mentioned yesterday. We know that, that was set up in Marbella uh, by Daniel Kinahan. But only last week, uh, Daniel Kinahan was again referred to by a High Court judge as one of the leaders of the Kinahan Crime Organisation Group. And that was in relation to an application by the Criminal Assets Bureau to seize a mansion in Dublin, once owned by Jim Mansfield Jr., who has been sent to prison himself for perverting the course of justice. And Daniel Kinahan was mentioned as one of two owners, Thomas Bomber Cavan, another associate of his who was serving a lengthy sentence over in England for drug trafficking offences, was mentioned as another owner of that. So, no, Daniel Kinnan wasn't specifically named yesterday, but the Kinnans were referenced. OK, Frank, it's going to be a busy few months for you, I suspect. Is it every day? Like, do we, something happens every day, basically, between now and whenever the trial finishes? Yes, so there was some evidence in relation to maps and photographs that were heard yesterday after the opening address. Some guard the witness gave evidence. We heard from the former president of the Boxing Union of Ireland, a man called Mel Crystal. He was doing the weigh-in that day. He described how Gary Sweeney, a boxer from Mayo, was being weighed. He was weighing him when shots were fired and when it all kicked off. He described seeing two of the gunmen running through the suite and he described leaving, exiting the building and he said that after he grabbed his stuff and he was making his exit, he said that in the hallway he saw two men clearly wounded and then he saw a body uh, in the reception area and he gave some very distressing evidence about what he saw as he left. So yes, witnesses will be called now for the foreseeable. Um, there may be some legal argument during this trial and in the ordinary course of things, you know, a jury would be excused. Yeah. A legal argument would take place in their absence. We wouldn't be able to talk Report about it us, until yeah. after the event, but this is a little bit different. It is a bit different, isn't it? And like, um, uh, obviously the whole point of not being able to report on stuff um, and not being able to talk about things when a jury is there is that in case the jury might get influenced but I always assume the assumption is that judges are not going to be influenced by anything they're reading in the papers because you know they're more qualified and they're, they're, not, they're above they're all not, of that. They're not they're not, like us. Yeah, they're, they're not influenced by, you know, they will say they're not influenced by the media coverage and all they're concerned about is the evidence, the yeah. evidence that is presented Does to that them. Does that change the how this box. case gets reported on, do you think, as time goes on, where, you know, people would be very, very reluctant to report or speculate or discuss or describe anything, whereas actually with a case like this, where it is Special Criminal Court, uh, those reporting conventions are less important. It's... A little bit different. I wouldn't say they're less important, but it's definitely, and I know it's a funny thing to say because I passed a number of Gardaí with machine guns as I entered the Special Criminal Court yesterday. So it seems like a strange thing to say that they're almost easier to cover and, you know, a little bit less uncomfortable than when there's a jury. I mean, you still have to be mindful of your role as a court reporter when you're covering cases before the Special Criminal Court. I mean, you can't say anything that could potentially prejudice against the case against uh, Jerry Hutch, but certainly it's a little bit more relaxed than when there's a jury there who are being told not to listen to Off the Ball yeah. and other shows on News Talk, not to read the newspapers, um, you know, because they could potentially read something that is inaccurate and potentially prejudicial. Yeah. So there generally we're a safe risk. haven as well. Mm. Put that out, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Jerry. Your job is safe, Shane. You're okay. <laughs> Frank, good stuff. Thanks a million. No problem. Uh, Frank Graney, um, giving us details on on this case, and I, I will reiterate that it is definitely a, a, a sports story. This is like embedded in boxing, and that, uh, like Mel Crystal, obviously is um, a storied. Um, person in Irish boxing history himself and his brother and their relationship with professional boxing goes back decades. So, uh, right. OTBAM is brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Up next, John Duggan in with the sports news. Uh, Shane and uh, Kathleen are in charge for the rest of the show this morning. First, though, from last night's slight tangent, Willow Callan named the actors he would like to see fa play famous sports people. Enjoy. 
right, okay. And so, the ideas I had, right, one that hasn't been made yet. Can we get, how are we judging these? I presume you can just respond. Like ten right or there and or 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 yeah, man, yeah, 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 it's like yeah. on a scale of 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 uh, one to Richard Harris. Oh yeah, I can see that. <laughs> okay, <That's> <laughs> <laughs> but like, okay, go on. Okay. All right, um, first one which has to be made is Andre Agassi. So his autobiography is like one of the best ever. I think there's yeah. been a few attempts to make the movie, was never quite happened. Yeah, yeah, Andre Agassi agreed. I'm gonna have Colin Farrell as Andre Agassi. It's too old. I don't know. I think I think he's forty. Oh, he is too old. He can play the penguin. Ah, these lads, these lads can make themselves look young these days. You, can't need, you need to have agility on the court. You need to be visibly. Mm. He'd I, think have, he'd, um, I think it'd be fine. Movie magic, lads. And he looks quite a bit like Agassi at Agassi's yeah, pomp yeah. as well. He shaved his head for movies before. He's got good facial growth, yep. much like Andre Agassi. Same eyebrows. He can do it. Yeah. When is the Banshee finish out? The, uh, the premiere, premiere was last week. Friday, so yeah. it's probably oh, now. So yeah. Looks what, good. What are the word? What's the word? Good. I think generally positive. Yeah, yeah. but you're putting me on the spot generally now. I'm not right. sure. Yeah, I don't. I'm gonna. I, I, I'm gonna like it regardless. I'll put that say. on the poster, Arthur. <laughs> Arthur D. It was grand. <laughs> Meant to be all right. Arthur D. Off the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Best selling author. <laughs> oh dear. Second one is okay, like we're all cheat. giving that a yay. By the way, just about. No, I'm not. You're not. It's happy. too. It's too different. The, the age. I'm just checking here. Andre Agassi's 52. Colin Farrell is 46. Yeah, exactly. Come on. He, you can't. Years, He'll have to play Agassi as a 20 year old. Is the problem? You, you I know. Can. Who are you getting to play Agassi? Yeah, on but you give him a week. I, I, did, I tell you what. I didn't like that book as much as everyone else. Ooh. Jeez, no. I didn't enjoy it as much. I, I like. It was, you could kind of tell what I was trying to do, but I wasn't blown away by it as, as kind of everyone kind of held it up. I, I wouldn't. I'd probably not make the movie. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and so, what did you think it was trying to do? Well, I was trying to tell. I mean, his story is no doubt compelling, and all the his relationship with his father and yeah. issues with drugs and everything else. But um, I just felt it was stretching a wee bit. Yeah, that's the lads on uh, a slight tangent last night on the show. Uh, OTBM brought to you live as always with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. It's 8.46 a.m. Kathleen's beside me in the studio as well. And we have John Duggan, as usual, at Sports News. Morning, John. Shane, Kathleen, how are we doing? Keeping well. Keeping well. You're excited for tonight as a Spurs fan or nervous, pensive? What's the, the, the main I'd overriding be I'd be disappointed if Spurs do a Spursy on it and lose the game. And for years, we had a very bad record at Old Trafford. Now, in recent years, it's not been too bad. We won 6-1 there a few years ago. And we beat them 3-0, I think, with Lucas Moore. And last season, a bit disappointing with Ronaldo scoring a hat-trick, I think it was. 3-2 mm. win for United. So, um, it'll be a good test to where Spurs are. Richarlison's injured, McTominay potentially back for United. But it'll be a good test to where both teams are this evening, 8-15 kickoff. Lads, it's Tottenham. Well, that's it. And... Uh, I think things were different then than they are now. Yeah, like we were we were chatting earlier about Matt Doherty and the fact that I know mm -hmm. Emerson is coming back after this game, but like there's been a, like the the hug at the weekend was something I didn't expect to see when he was coming off. He probably only took took him off in the 90th minute to get the ovation, which was nice because we were all thinking, "Oh, can't he hate Matt Doherty?" Despises him, and yet the relationship clearly we don't know about. So that it's not all doom and gloom. Well, it seems to be manager psychology. That's what it clearly seems to be that he put it up to him publicly. And uh, he feels that the players responded. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't work. Mm. But uh, Matt Doherty looks super fit. And I don't think Emerson is a very good player uh, for the level that Antonio Conte aspires to be, to be with Tottenham, which is challenging for trophies. And so I think Matt Doherty's got a chance if he can keep his place in the team now. Um, but I, I really do believe if you're good enough, it's a bit like the GA, a little bit like Jim Gavin and the Brian Cody's. If you're good enough to be in an Antonio Conte's team, it doesn't really matter what your reputation is. He'll either drop you or he'll put you in. Mm. So I, I do feel like the players like Cessna have got a chance. Uh, other players have just were just jettisoned. Like in Dombelli was a record signing out of the club. Wings left, you know, and like someone like Brian Heal has come into the club and getting a bit of game time at the end of matches now. So Conte knows the time of day. He knows what he's doing. And I just hope he stays at the club. If you take your Spurs cap off and put your Irish very, cap on. Very difficult thing. <laughs> <laughs> but how does that then say if you're good enough to be in Conte's rotation, then you're quite good. What does that mean, though, for Doherty in terms of when he comes to Ireland camp and he hasn't had the minutes? And I know you're saying he looks fit now, but if he hasn't had those minutes playing in the team. Well, that is an issue, I think. Uh, so one of the things I feel pretty strongly about Kathleen, that Doherty got caught for that goal against Scotland. Mm. I do think you need to have match sharpness and... I'm always going for players that have match sharpness over anybody who's not 
uh, like Shane Duffy's not playing, for example, at the moment. Mm. Um, interestingly, Joe Hodge came off the bench last night for Wolves against Crystal Palace. So you have Nathan Collins playing, you've got Gavin Bazunu playing. There's no question now who the goalkeeper is, for example, yeah. in the Republic of Ireland team. No question that is Gavin Bazunu because he's getting regular game time in a Premier League club. So I'm a big believer in match sharpness as a, as a different thing. Now, I'm a bit of the hurler in the ditch. I didn't play football at the top level, but I, you know, from watching it for 25, 30 years, 35 years, match sharpness, is, I think, is a key thing. A couple of missing players for Spurs tonight. Like, well, well Richarlison's out and Kulisevsky's out. So they're two of the more attacking players. So mm. I'd say what he'll probably do is play 3 5 2. I'd expect him to play Basuma in the middle uh, or maybe skip and uh, flood the midfield because, to be fair, United haven't done too badly. I think the good possession stats against Newcastle. Yeah, mm. a lot of possession. And yeah, close to like seventy percent. Yeah, for like a lot of the game. It's just the chances they can't they can't score goals. Yeah, yeah. like well, I do think Rashford has got back to some degree of of, of the form that he was he in. I mean, you missed, he missed a sitter. <clears throat> um, uh, but seems to be we're saying that a lot about Rashford though as well. He misses like he's back to better form. He's doing a lot better, but he missed a sitter. Yeah, yeah. He, he needs to cut that out of his game. He, yeah, he, he has had a good season generally speaking compared to what he was last year. But, but he, he, like he looked like he was gone. Yeah, and uh, to say a lot about strikers, all about confidence. As a, as a Spurs fan, are you hoping Ronaldo plays tonight? Or are you hoping Ronaldo doesn't play tonight? I'm kind of hoping that he does because uh, Ronaldo walks around. That says it all. Like, <laughs> I've, and I've, I saw Ronaldo back in February against Leeds. I saw him. You, you know, you can tell fifty percent more from seeing players live. And Ronaldo walks around. That's what he's there to do. Like the goal he took against Everton was was really really well t- taken, um, but he doesn't offer anything really apart from that predatory instinct. He's not the player he was. And as much as he might want to sulk, Ten Hag knows that. And it's because Rashford wasn't fully right the other day, it wasn't well. Um, I'd expect, if, if I was Ten, if I was a Spurs fan, I, which I am, I'd be a bit more worried uh, if, 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 it, if Ronaldo didn't play. You just hope he doesn't do what he did to his last season? Yeah, I, 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 I think United are probably a bigger threat with Adam in the team. Mm. Um, as they were against Arsenal. I don't think he played against Liverpool either mm. when they won those matches at home. So, um, Interesting match tonight. It, it'll tell a lot, uh, as will the other ones. Liverpool-West Ham. I think West Ham are improving Yeah, uh, under Moyes. I, th- I, I think he's got a better fluidity to the attack now. I don't think it's a, a penalty kick for Liverpool at all. Everton going to Newcastle. And Alexander Isak is now out until after the World Cup. Very sad news for Diogo Jota out of the, until um, from after the World Cup. And we have, what, Bournemouth taking on Southampton. Southampton, I think, are struggling. So Bournemouth might fancy their chances in that one. And the other game is Chelsea away to Brentford. I don't know if you saw the, the great quotes from David Moyes in the paper this morning where he's referencing Jurgen Klopp getting sent off at the weekend and almost intimating that he did it on purpose to G up his players and get behind them. Comes into the manager psychology thing. Like It, would, it does make sense you know, for a manager to kind of gesticulate, get themselves sent off because it shows the players in the pitch. Well, well, it's happened a couple of times at Anfield. It happened last season when was it Arteta and Klopp got into a bit of a row and then Liverpool, I think, scored straight afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I do think Klopp was out of order, which is what he sent to the referee. But to be fair to me, he apologised immediately and held his hands up. And, you know, th- these weird comments that are attributed to the unnamed city official, are, it, it's a strange kind of vibe at the moment. I'd be definitely on the Liverpool side when it comes to all of that kind of stuff. Um, um, Chelsea going to Brentford, as I said, so... And Golo Conte out of the World Cup as well. Mm. What else happened, John? Some big, some big cricket news in the last while. Yeah, I don't like cricket. I love it. And <laughs> Ireland are back in the hunt to qualify for the Super 12s of the T20 World Cup. Really exciting stuff for the last hour, folks. In Hobart, they beat Scotland by six wickets. They were struggling early. I didn't think they were going to do it. But Curtis Camphor took 72 off 32 balls. 72 not out. And he got a great partnership with George Shockerel. George with 39 not out. Ireland set 177 to win. Their greatest run chase in ever in T20, what they've achieved this morning, getting to 180. And Captain Andrew Balberni spoke to Sky Sports after the game. He's hoping an impressive victory can give his team momentum now. Yeah, it was pretty special. I can't remember as an important partnership as that. Um, all year we've played pretty good cricket. Um, there's been times when we've been out of the game and we've come out throwing punches and maybe just fell short. So to actually get over the line with that sort of a you know a punch thrown is great. And yeah, that was a pretty special knock from Curtis and, and George as well. And uh, we're just delighted and hopefully we can take that momentum into Friday. So the deal now is that Scotland, Ireland and Zimbabwe all have two points. Zimbabwe play the West Indies shortly and we play the West Indies on Friday so we're still right back in the hunt for the mm. Super 12s and Scotland beat the West Indies on yes. Monday so I mean yeah. um, not, that, not that it necessarily dictates that they're going to win but um, you'd almost hope the Zimbabwe win today and then it's really between ourselves and, and Scotland Yeah. Uh, for 
that that place in the Super 12s would be great for us to get there. We're not going to pull up any trees in this tournament, but um, you do want to see a sense of progress after the the golden years of the Kevin O'Brien years and the and the shocks against Pakistan and and England at limited overs cricket. This is slightly different. It's only T20, but still important for us to get there. We're having a good record against Scotland in the last couple of weeks. We really are. I love that you brought that up again. So I get <laughs> no songs now. No songs <laughs> no, in the OTB studio. No songs. No Do you know, songs. I was actually, a guy came up to me in the pub in Neary's on Friday, a regular OTB AM watcher, and he was like, I love whenever you're on. You were beaming during the week. He was like, every <laughs> single time they had you on, you just couldn't stop smiling. Yeah, you were yeah. clearly delighted with yourself. And I was like, yeah. Well, by contrast, your, your nerves before the game were like, passing into the rest of us I think because we were kind of trying to stay I was trying to stay positive but like the nerves were palpable from everyone I think we all had the element of nerves but any excuse to bring it back up oh, and definitely. keep talking about it and a good point in Aries as well yeah, well, very nice point uh, what else is happening John? yeah so I went through the Premier League games there also six matches in the championship this evening Burnley and Sheffield United with the opportunity to go top if they can uh, Burnley went to Birmingham City Sheffield United going to Coventry City elsewhere Blackpool playing Hull QBR versus Cardiff Wigan taking on Middlesbrough Millwall up against Watford always important to follow these matches as well folks because of the Irish interest in on these teams Kelly Harrington Aoife O'Rourke, Caitlin Friars and Casey Rock all in quarterfinal action at the European Women's Elite Boxing Championships in Montenegro today. We already have four co- confirmed bronze medalists from yesterday's action. Andy Farrell, the Ireland rugby head coach, will name his squad later for the November internationals against South Africa, Fiji and Australia. Cork's Aaron Hill, I'm sure you've mentioned him, Shane, shocking Joe Trump last night, four mm-hmm. frames to one in the Northern Ireland Open. But important, I think, that he progresses now through the tournament and improves that ranking of 95 in the world. There's also racing scheduled. I, I hope it goes ahead with all this rain. You'd have to wonder. Navin today at 140 on the flat. And the flat can take it more than the jumps, but we'll see what happens there. Just keep an eye, folks, if you're planning to go to Navin on the forecast and also on the racing post and listen to our bulletins on Newstalk. Keep playing the, the rainfall radar. Uh, Bob Dwyer commenting. Spurs regular course John John speaking about seeing players live was over at Spurs Everton Harry Kane is looking world class I can't see Spurs losing this evening draw worst case scenario for us Spurs fans confident well Harry Kane I saw him in Frankfurt luckily enough and the close control that he has on the ball wow blew my head off and once again these small things you see the runs I, I, I just think Harry Kane I know maybe at international level at the biggest stage he hasn't really delivered but he's playing very well and yeah. if England can I, I don't trust Gareth Southgate to do it, but if England had a proper shape, uh, Harry Kane could could really light up the World Cup. I kind of found that, you know, when you see certain player live, like last year I saw Mo Salah live for the first time mm. at Old Trafford, and I was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. It sounds obvious to say Kane and Salah are great players, but you know when you see players of that ilk, you're like... I got that when I saw Lauren Hemp for the first time playing for England. It was one of the friendlies ahead of the Euros, and like I knew she was fast. I've talked about her for like a year, and then I actually watched her, and I was like, the movement she had <laughs> yeah. off the ball, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't doing her justice. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes yeah. you need to see these players live. Uh, Pat Butler's commented, John Duggan, dot, dot, dot. Legend. Oh, thanks very much, Pat. Well, John, listen, thanks as always. That kind of weighs uh, what's the ten percent of the ninety percent of negative comments. That exactly. On these yeah, yeah. It's only ever positive on YouTube and Twitter. To be fair, like to be fair, to, uh, maybe people are, are are being nicer now because uh, I think you're talking about David Moyes there. I was seeing uh, they did an Ask David Moyes thing on Sky Sports on Twitter yesterday. I was, oh, here we go. There's going to be a lot of a lot of a lot of stick, but most of the questions were actually legitimate yeah. and interesting, and or maybe even like why why did you have Skamak in the team or you know so. Maybe the maybe people are changing their mind their 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 ways about being a bit more nice on on social media because um, the cesspit that it can be sometimes is is not very encouraging for humanity. But I'm hoping that people can be a bit nicer when it comes to uh, you know analyzing how people do their jobs. Yeah, well, we've got a bit of time left on the show this morning, so if anyone wants to comment on YouTube and tell us how much you love. Kathleen and myself and Joe. Or just put out a talking point. A, a talking point's always good. What you know, what talking point would you want to, every, people yeah. to discuss on the show? You know, there are plenty of things to talk about, whether it's referee abuse in the GA or whether it's um, the Premier League situation or whether it's Manchester City or whether it's sports washing, whether it's the Qatar World Cup, whatever it is, or the amount of injuries that seem to be prevalent in rugby at the moment ahead of these uh, big games in November or Leinster Munster. What has gone wrong with Munster? Mm. Yeah, exactly. That hasn't been a talking point for us at all over the last few weeks. <laughs> no, no, it's not going anywhere either. So there's plenty of things to discuss. and um, It's almost like an Ask Shane, Ask Kathleen. Uh, yeah, it doesn't ask, have to be ask. a cesspit of... No, it doesn't, no, no. Yeah. Um, and uh, like, I think it's important for people to have robust opinions and it's also important for people to disagree with your opinions. Um, and that's absolutely absolutely welcome, but hopefully within the lines. Here, here. Well, legend John Duggan, right, thanks folks. as always. Thanks See you.
Uh, John there as always with us uh, on, a, on, a, on a weekday morning give us the, the latest in the news across the sports world and congrats to the Irish uh, cricketers it's a great win against Scotland great comeback win as well O2B AM brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember effortless shave magnificent Mo you can sign up or donate now at Movember.com time to uh, tell you what we've got on OTB Sports Radio coming up today from 1 o'clock it's OTB Gold Joe meeting Sherlock Nan 3 o'clock we've got Coy Gig 4 o'clock it's a retro panel on losing the dressing room 6 o'clock OTB Gold again inside Padraig Harrington's gaff and then of course the show live from 7 o'clock Joe live with Off The Ball this evening follow OTB across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the very best excuse me in the latest sports content back after these ads with the Irish Independence Key and Tracy on the day that Andy Farrell is set to name his Autumn Nations series squad first here's Joe speaking with David Brady on last night's show I suppose it made national news as well there was obviously a bit of a, a, a coming together uh, towards the end of the game players and uh, you were half involved, I think, while well, shouting in from a bit of a distance from what I saw. And uh, Connor Gillespie, the Summerhill manager, was involved as well. And then I think he thought you dunted him. And so he gave you a shoulder. And in fairness to him, it's, it's quite refreshing to see his post-match comments. Because oh, look- what he said about the incident, just for anyone who didn't see it, was he said, I turned around, I got a dunt in the back. At the time, I interpreted that David had dunted me. And to be fair, he hadn't. He was just standing in his position. I turned around into him, but I thought he had dunted me. And I reacted to that and I shouldered him to the ground. To be fair, the fault for that lies on my behalf. I misinterpreted the situation. I reacted in a poor way and paid the price and cost my team a minute or two of play as well. So it was an example of poor leadership that was punished. I mean... In fairness, no one's it's perfect, no and we we do need to get this out of the GAA. Like it's not to condone it totally, but ah. I, you can you can respect somebody who just holds their hands up as well. It's, it's you know what for me it's an example of great leadership that it, we all have a little moment. And Connor, it, it, it probably epitomises what Summerhill bring to the table and what their team is and their ethos is. He's straight away, and you're going to yourself, and it was it was look at you can blow, blown out of all proportion. It was something small. But myself and Connor chatted afterwards, and even you know, long after the game, we had a conversation. And uh, sure, it's it's, it's man's is uh, it, it's 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 minuscule. And when I said to you that both teams in Copper for Jacks last night, um, that's that's testament to to what what went down. What went down was a county final um, that was absolutely nip and talk all the way, all the way. Mm. People, uh, I had a perception, if I'm being honest, of football going into it. And my perception has been turned as hit from from uh, an ability and talent uh, right across the county. That when you, when you, I didn't know one in the meet to the other, but I know it all. But I know there's a, there's a fine, fine crop of players, um, some on the county team and others that won't are armed on the county team, but should be and will be, I'd hope. And I think Colum would, Colum O'Rourke would uh, identify those players. Um, but it's 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 by no means it's not, it's not the county that I that I uh, my opinion has been has been um, enlightened. Mm. I thought you went down easy as well. To be honest with you, a little dramatic. I I, I went out to the door today and there was two Oscars outside. <laughs> <laughs> Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? Uh, I do feel sorry for Roy Keane. Like, I mean, where can he go for a bit of peace? You would think a corporate box at an American football game. You might, I presume, it's a corporate box of some description or some kind of hospitality. The seats look comfortable. Yeah, you think you might, you might be around people who might understand that you, you deserve a little bit of space. What did you say, Vera? Tell me, you we got two World Cup show. Who cares? <laughs> Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts, and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember effortless shave magnificent Mo. three minutes past nine on this Wednesday morning on OTB AM and we uh, time to talk rugby Cian Tracy rugby writer with the Irish Independent joins us on the line this morning morning Cian how are things Hey Shane, all good. Um, was one of the people stuck in the mental traffic out there this morning, so apologies for that. Um, I was interested listening to your chat there with JD and Kathleen about kind of players that you see live and United and stuff. I was actually in Old Trafford on, on Sunday for the first time in a long time, but right. unfortunately, unfortunately, no kind of um, performances that might live in the memory that stand out. The atmosphere, the atmosphere at Old Trafford gets criticised the odd time, but it's uh, I'm sure for games like that where there's a bit of a uh, you know, a juice behind Newcastle, especially now, it uh, it adds to it a little bit. Yeah, I was behind the goal, kind of where at the end, the opposite end to the Stretford end, so the Newcastle fans were in the corner making plenty of noise. I actually didn't think the the atmosphere was too bad. 
But I, I was a bit like a child. Like I hadn't been to a Premier League game and I don't get to go to many games as a supporter or whatever anymore just with the job. Um, so I was like a kid at the playground. I was absolutely just loving the, the atmosphere and stuff. I wouldn't say it was like incredibly hostile or t intimidating two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon probably is an ideal either. But um, yeah, pretty good, a pretty good day out besides the, the fact that the match was utterly unforgettable. But you, I was thinking back to just when you, you were talking about Salah, you know, when you saw him live, I think the, the, the one player that always stands out to me is seeing Mbappe live. Um, I just had kind of no concept or appreciation for how quick he is off the mark. And was, I remember I was covering um, back when I used to cover football when Ireland played France in Paris a few years ago. It was just, just insane. So um, I went to Old Trafford on Sunday hoping that, I don't know, Sancho or someone like that um, might give me something to remember. But it was uh, pretty forgettable, uh, the stuff on the pitch anyway. You've picked a couple of forgettable games. Were you, you were in Connacht last weekend, Kian? <laughs> Yeah, like that. I don't. Yeah, like it, that was weird. That was one for the the purest. I think people would yeah, say. Yeah, forget it was maybe a bit harsh. Yeah, may, maybe I would count myself as a purist as well because it was like tough enough to write, you know, a nine hundred word match report on the on the whistle. But at the same time, you couldn't really take take your eyes off it. Uh, both teams were kind of throwing plenty of punches at each other, and while it might not have been the try fest that you know we'd love to see, I thought there was still plenty in it um, for both teams. Really, actually. Uh, like Connacht, it's it's hard to know. Like, because Leinster, I guess, uh, are the dominant team at the minute. But uh, they were they weren't terrible. Connacht, which sounds like a straight strange thing to say, uh, given that the, they didn't get in the scoreboard whatsoever. But was it? I was listening to the lads on Monday Night Rugby the other night, and they were kind of talking about nine forays into the into the twenty two for Leinster and just couldn't convert. Like, is that is that an issue for them conversion, or do you give some excuse to the fact that the rain started pouring on on a quarter hour and didn't stop? Uh, I don't think the rain can be an excuse. Like if anyone's used to playing in the, those conditions, it's Connacht. And the irony was like by the time I arrived in Galway, the sun was splitting the stones and it was like a cracking even. And you were looking at this new 4G pitch. It looked the part. And then sure enough, the, the game picked off and the rain came in and the wind picked up. So I don't think Connacht will ever use that as an excuse. If anything, they would see that as an advantage because they're more used to playing it, even though it does kind of go against the style of rugby that they're looking to play. Um yeah, look, Connacht did a lot of the, the difficult things well, which I think would be the most frustrating part for them. Um, like, I thought the period on half time was pretty much the, the winning and the losing of the game. They were camped on the Leinster line. Leinster were conceding penalties and their mall just got shoved into touch. And that's a pretty kind of unforgiv unforgivable error at this level. And it kind of just summed up Connacht's wastefulness. They were putting themselves in good positions. And to be fair, Leinster had to defend really well and they did defend really well. So, I think if you were coming on here and saying that, you know, Connacht didn't really fire a shot and Leinster ran over them and were far too physical, uh, which Leinster have done to, to plenty of teams in the past, I think you'd be far more critical. So I think, you know, Connacht have had obviously a very tough start to the season, but I think there were definitely more encouraging aspects in this game than there has been for from other defeats earlier this season. Do you think that tough start to the season to a certain extent prepared them for a game like that against Leinster? Because obviously if Connacht are going to play Leinster, playing them at home on a wet night is probably what they want. And I, I like I was kind of dipping in and out of the match and every time I checked the scoreline, I expected Leinster to have run away with it by the time they got that first try. But they just never seemed to manage to get it. And do you think maybe there was a, I know maybe a sharpness is probably the wrong word considering the fact that they didn't score, but was there a certain element that maybe the last few games have served Connacht well to a certain extent? Yeah, like that's definitely the glass half full approach. I mean, the, the, their start to their season is was disastrous, really. And I just mean the fixture list. And it's been well documented why that happened, because the the new pitch wasn't ready, which is just really, really frustrating from an organizational point of view. And even then, when the fixture computer throws, throws up games like that, it's, it's really, really tough. And even you think back to the, the Munster game was in the sports ground and then the Lens, the Leinster game was last week. So two weekends in a row, this early in the season, Connacht have had pretty much, I would say, their two marquee fixtures when it comes to the URC. And, and now they're gone. Obviously, they'll they'll get to play away. So it's been a really, really tricky start to the season, I would say, on and off the pitch for them. But yeah, maybe it, it did sharpen them up. I thought I, I do think they deserve a lot of credit for how well they defended because, like you said, Kathleen, they scored a try. Leinster scored a try after, I think it was three minutes. And you're kind of thinking, OK, the floodgates could could really open here but you had to wait till the 77th minute when Kieran Frawley came on and kicked a penalty to really give Leinster that 
slight cushion, if even you can call it that. So I do think Connacht deserve a lot of credit. I think their defence has been a major issue over the last couple of seasons. Pete Wilkins has come on board as head coach and switched back to defence uh, from attack where he was doing last season. So maybe it would just take a little bit of time to get back to use to, to his methods and stuff. So I think it's encouraging, but it's just, it's so important now that they back up what they did well this week against the Scarlets. And then next week they're going to Ospreys and they're going to finish off this block of games and if they could get two wins over the next two weeks I think the, com- the complexion will look a lot different and you know the, the pain of what they've suffered in the first few weeks of the season will look a lot different but on the flip side if they were to lose to the Scarlets or if they were to lose to the Ospreys as well then Connacht are, are looking at a very very long season but I certainly think they they showed enough last week to suggest they can get two wins over the next two weeks. Kian uh, Andy Farrell names his, uh, his squad for these November internationals later on this afternoon and uh, like I guess the story out of Leinster has been the injuries, look, it is five wins from five, as you said, but uh, from last weekend against Connacht, you have Jack Conan with an eye injury, James Ryan knee, Josh van der Fleer ankle, they'll get further assessment. Um, but then Will Connors, Ronan Kelleher, Harry Byrne all missing out at the minute, and then you have the long-term absentees of, of James Lowe, James Tracy, Charlie Ryan, Gibson Park, Tommy O'Brien. Like, it's quite an extensive list. Um, like Jeremy had the point with, with me before we came on air this morning where he was kind of saying all these injuries could actually play into Andy Farrell's hands to some degree. It gives him... Uh, less of a selection headache, but it also gives opportunity for other players who, who mightn't have had the chance to play in November, the chance to get some game time. Yeah, it's a pre- it was a pretty costly um, weekend on the back of like other guys like Jordan Larmer, who suffered an injury a few weeks ago. And then, you know, Munster's injury uh, update drops yesterday and there were some big hitters on that as well. So, I mean, my understanding was up until yesterday, Andy Farrell still hadn't even finalised his squad because there were so many doubts over over players waiting for results of scans and things like that. So, it's not ideal. Um, my sort of sense of that, like, will it give players a chance? I got, I'm all for that. And I think the the Ireland A game, they'll, they'll play New Zealand the, um, next month, is going to be massively important for that as well. On the back of the Emerging Ireland Tour, which I think we've seen the positives to that. You look at guys like Jack Crowley and Tom O'Hearn have come back into Munster and really hit the ground running. So I think you're seeing a knock-on effect of that. But I don't know. I think with South Africa first up, I know it's only a November international, but I just think that game is enormous um, for Ireland. Just in terms of building on what they did in the summer, obviously incredible achievement for winning winning a series in New Zealand. But I just I still think there's a few question marks over Ireland when they go up against a team like South Africa, like France, uh, to a certain extent like England with big packs, less so England, but certainly France and South Africa. And for all like that they achieved in the summer, I just don't think that um, that All Blacks pack is on the same level as the spring box in terms of physicality and stuff. So I would, I really hope that by the time we are nearly three weeks away from the game Saturday, uh, three weeks, two weeks, I should say. So I really hope that by the time the game, that game comes around, it's not a kind of patched up um, Ireland team because I think it's a massive, massive test to see where they are. They're going to play South Africa in the World Cup pool stages next year as well, which is obviously going to be an incredibly tough task. So I think like if Ireland were playing with a patched up team and I, I also think, I also hope by the way, that the Springboks have a full team. I would just love to see Ireland and the Springboks going to head full-blooded just to see where Ireland stand because for all that the Springboks might get criticised for their style of play, it's bloody effective and it's it's been exactly what Ireland have struggled against in the past. So um, I think it's massive for the psyche of this team. I think if they were to, like I said, to build on winning a series in New Zealand by beating the world champions in Dublin, that would really set them up well. And I think then, like I said, you have the A game against the New Zealand 15, whatever they're calling it, the All Blacks 15, Fiji, you'll absolutely see guys come in. Like I just mentioned a couple of them there, like the likes of Tom Ahern, Jack Crowley, maybe Kieran Frawley, another one kind of in the mix. And then Australia, I think as well, would give you more scope than than South Africa first up. So it's almost a pity that the box are, are first and not at the back end of November to give guys extra time to to recover. Yeah, like some of the some of the names, like RG Snaman, uh, Keith Earls, Conway, Zebo, all, all carrying knocks for for Munster. We get criticised sometimes for uh, focusing on Munster uh, first off when they're doing badly, and then kind of putting them back to the bottom of the the pecking order when they're doing well. So we should mention the the win against the Bulls, thirty one seventeen, played well, uh, and and probably an important win for them as well, especially when they have, as you mentioned, the Aviva coming up this Saturday against Leinster. Um, where are they at at the minute? Because, you know, if, if they do lose these couple of games, even before the November internationals, it's back to, I guess it's back to all the negative talk. 
it was a massively important win. Um, lots of lots of impressive aspects to it. I think I, before I go any further, I would caveat by saying I thought the Bulls were were really poor, really disappointing. A, a kind of a shadow of the side that beat Leinster in the semi final last year, but that's absolutely nothing got to do with Munster. Munster probably made them look poorer than what they were as well. So I think they deserve huge credit. I think for you know we've seen very very few glimpses of the attacking shape and what Munster are trying to do here and there over the first few games of the season, but. While it was by no means perfect, it was far more evident what they were trying to do, looking to play to edges. And I think so much, so much of that came about from the fact that they were just far better in contact. Like that's been a major issue. Even going back into preseason, their two defeats in preseason, it was a major issue. Just kind of falling off tackles and not being kind of at the pitch where they need to be. And the coaches have been pretty honest about this, as they have been, to be fair, about their struggles. Like no one is kind of shying away from it, but... I think a lot of that came down to the fact that they're trying to load the players with so much in new information in terms of like game plans, strategies, you know, shapes, um, defensive systems, things like that, where I think the basics in terms of, you know, work rate or around the breakdown and things like that maybe got a little bit lost. And I think that's why a lot of people, including myself, have been so critical because kind of those prerequisites just haven't been at the standard that you'd expect of any team, let alone a team like Munster. So I think when you start to see that, come to fruition which it did a lot of times last week you can see how effective they can be like I said they, they they weren't exactly firing on all cylinders but it was very encouraging to see them playing to the edges and that's exactly what Mike Prendergast wants to do I mean you saw Jack Crowley come on in the second half playing off Joey Carberry the two playmakers I thought was really encouraging Shane Daly is another guy who would be very hopeful of making the Ireland squad later today I thought he made a difference at fullback and Joey Carberry played with a lot more freedom than he has done against a team who were, you know, coming hard at the line and he took a lot of big hits. Uh, a couple of them were fractionally on, you know, on, on the side of being late. And that's kind of the the issue Joey Carberry's had in the past that those kind of opposition teams have kind of left him with broken arms and things like that. But I thought he he was really robust and he he looked like Joey Carberry's at his best when he's playing with a swagger and he just had so many injuries that... I imagine his confidence has been dented. I just don't know how it can't be when your body just hasn't been, you know, serving you as it should be. So, and another thing about, you know, it, it's a fact there's so much expected of Joey Carberry when he's playing with Munster, but when you're playing behind a pack, which he has been a lot, that's getting beaten up and going backwards. It's very difficult for any out half to, to be dictating matters. So like you could have, you could have Johnny Sex, and you'd have Dan Carter in your prime playing behind that Munster pack at times over the last few years and they would struggle as well. So I thought there was lots of encouraging aspects, Shane, to be honest. But at the same time, I don't think uh, any realistic supporters and I absolutely don't think the players or the, the coaches will be getting ahead of themselves, especially not when you look at what's coming on Saturday. I was just about to ask, where does that leave them then for this weekend? Because obviously two teams in two very different positions, although maybe some of the injuries in Leinster might give Munster a bit of cause for hope? Yeah, maybe. I just think Munster's injury list is pretty heavy as well. And I think with, you know, guys like Ty Byrne and Craig Casey, um, it would have been like, hopefully he's fit. I, we're waiting to hear an update on Craig Casey, but it would have been fascinating to see if he was fit. Was he going to start this weekend? Because that would have told a lot, I think, about the direction Munster are heading in. And, you know, you kind of touched on it there earlier, Shane, like Jameson Gibson Park has a hamstring injury, hasn't played yet this season. And that is a big concern uh, going into November. I'd imagine he'll probably still be named in the squad. I'd imagine Andy Farrell is going to give, you know, as many of his frontliners every chance to prove their fitness in time for that Springboks game. But just say uh, Jameson Gibson Park, um, who, by the way, has become so important to the way Ireland play. Let's say he was out for the Springboks game. Who starts at scrum half? So uh, I think Craig Casey will be doing everything he can to prove his fitness, even for this weekend. But to go back to your question, Kathleen, I think if guys are carrying knocks, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they're sat out for this weekend. So while Leinster could be missing, you know, Josh van der Fleer, say, for example, or James Ryan, who both picked up the injuries last week, Jack Cohen and got a cut in his eye, they might be sat out this weekend. But you, on the flip side, you might have, um, like I said, Craig Casey and Ty Byrne, Edwin Adogbo, who's been a revelation since Munster breaking into the team. He's also carrying an injury. Stephen Archer. So I think it just depends on how guys come through the week because I, I talked about, you know, two full teams in terms of Ireland and South Africa going head to head. But certainly the mute, mood music at the early part of the week doesn't seem like we're going to see two full strength uh, Munster and Leinster teams this weekend, which is a pity. Yeah, and that, that Craig Casey point uh, to, to replace Gibson Park potentially is something that I know Gordon Darcy was uh, offering as well on, on Monday Night Rugby, which which is an interesting point. And yeah, as you said, hopefully his, uh, his fitness issues can, can go behind him. Um, 
not that we should just finally touch uh, Keane on, on, on Ulster because they're 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 exciting to watch. Um, look, very leaky in the defence, but they score a lot of tries as well. They had that 39-37 win over the Lions uh, at Ellis Park at the weekend. Michael Lowry, man of the match. Um, is he someone who can now really target these November internationals? I know, as we said, Keenan is still a doubt. So it's going to be a big few weeks for Michael Lowry. Yeah, it is. Um, I still think that, you know, backup fullback slot is very much up for grabs. I think they they tried to have a look at it uh, over the summer. Um, if I'm being honest, I didn't think Michael Lowry took his chances in the Maori game over the summer. I was actually a little bit disappointed because I'm a massive fan and you can see you touching it there, Shane, what he brings to the Ulster attack. But I felt like it was a bit of a missed opportunity for him. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the coaches look at that. I, my sense is that Hugo Keenan will be fit for the South Africa game. Um, if he does and play against Munster this weekend I'd be surprised not to see him maybe feature uh, in Leinster's game next week before they go into camp so that'll be one to, to keep an eye on Jimmy O'Brien is another guy he's done He's done well this season. He did really well in the rain in Galway last week. Um, but yeah, Michael Lowry was outstanding last week, last week. Look, we all know what he's capable of. And on his debut, he scored two tries and passed off the, the hat-trick for James Lowe. And most other people would have absolutely grabbed that with, with both hands. He's a really popular guy in amongst the squad. So um, his, Ulster, his Ulster form is unquestionable. I just think he'll have a, a couple of regrets about how this summer went for him but look he's so young um, I'd imagine he'll be he'll be right in the frame and the fact that he did start the, the Maori games um, makes me think that Farrell is probably looking at him as the backup to Hugo Keenan but it's certainly a position um, that's up for grabs and you touch on the Ulster attack I mean you see you know, Robert Balakoon was one of the guys who went in the Emerging Ireland Tour and probably the one guy who you would have looked at and said, did he really kind of need to go on that? Because I think he is within touching distance of breaking into that Ireland team. I'd be shocked if if he can stay if he can stay fit. I'd be shocked if he's not right in there come the, come the first game of the World Cup next year. His issue has been injuries at really unfortunate times. He was supposed to go on the, the plane to New Zealand, picked up an injury in Ulster's last game of last season. So he's a guy who we all know what he's capable of, but you can you saw him again coming in off the emerging Ireland and he was bouncing with with confidence and excitement as well. So I still think there's a few question marks. You kind of touching the chain over Ulster's defence. And in particular, their front five. Ian Henderson is another guy who we haven't mentioned in terms of being injured when the Ireland squad gets named. He hasn't played this season since he picked up a new injury in New Zealand as well. And I still think they're they're quite reliable on him. And when it comes to the crunch, and this is going to be a big game this weekend against the Sharks, particularly because you'd imagine their Springboks, who a lot of them were on the bench last week, are going to be starting this week. So you look at like Etzebet and Khaleesi, just a, a monstrous pack. So that is where Ulster's Achilles heel has been for the last few years. So if they could beat the Sharks this weekend, I think it would be a massive feather in their cap going forward for the rest of the season. Yeah, for sure. And uh, look, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on Andy Farrell's squad announcement this, this afternoon as well. Key and great stuff as always. Thanks a million. Cheers, guys. Chat to you later. Key and Tracy there, rugby writer with the Irish Independent, of course. And uh, you can listen back to Key and uh, all the other pieces from this morning's show on uh, the podcasts, in the usual podcast channels, and of course on YouTube as well. Kathleen, great stuff as always. Thanks Thank you, Shane. Appreciate it. Score prediction for United Spurs? 2-1 uh, United. Yeah, I feel like a 2-1 or a 2-2 maybe. Yeah, it's like going to be close and yeah. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of goals either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hopefully, just an ex give us an exciting game. Uh, it's the only quarter past eight game as well and there's a few games that... Uh, Especially have, after uh, last night we oh, deserve it. <laughs> dire. Two brutal games. Uh, so th thanks a many, Kathleen. As, uh, as always, OTBM back tomorrow morning with Tony Evans on that panorama doc about the turmoil Liverpool fans faced at the Champions League final last May in Paris. Uh, Westmead, the county footballer Luke Lachlan will be on the show as well to bring us his remarkable story and we'll have the return of you had to be there with Vinnie Perth joining us live in studio in the meantime we're leaving with the football show from last night enjoy and we'll chat to you tomorrow good luck oh. hi Joe this is bringing back memories yeah back in the uh, the old studio yeah well it's, I mean, it's actually it's newer looking than it was yeah. the last time we would have been in here talking we mentioned earlier on if you're just tuning in our uh, off the ball studios as you know and love them, listeners. You'll see them on uh, your social feeds. They're being upgraded currently. And so we're in the News Talks studios. Yeah. Which is where you and I used to have it's, many uh, conversations. It's novelty. Yeah. So you've been in here doing a couple of, your, done a couple of current affairs cameos, haven't you? So sure have, yeah. You look, you look quite comfortable in that seat. Mm -hmm. Not like you could just start talking about the economy at any second. Answer the question, Minister. <laughs> yeah. That's, all this, that's, that's, that's say, basically yeah. what you need to yeah. do, yeah. We've uh, lots to get through. Duffer. Let's talk Duffer. Damien Duff's Shelburne in the FEI Cup final. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, 
like in, in what February when he was well, he wasn't appointed in February. He was appointed around this time last year, I suppose. But when the season started on February, there was an element of how's this going to go. It's gone really well, you know. Um, yes, they're what they're like seventh, I think, in the table. They're not going to probably finish any higher. Um, but like, when you think about his, like, maybe when you cover it all the time, as I have been, like, you, you don't really, you know, you just get used to it, and that's the thing. Like, I mean. You know, there was this big fanfare around, you know, Duffer at the start and the first game was televised and all. But, you know, he's, he's just, he's just in some ways, he's just slotted into the League of Ireland scene quite sort of comfortably. Like, not everything is a big talking point. You know, you can go to Michelle's game and to be a handful of press lads talking to him and that's it, you know. No, it's, it's he, not like uh, Roy Keane proportions. No. He has settled in. Not at all. Very, very. And like, in a way, like some people who probably didn't know him, and I'm not pretending to know him either, um, but some people didn't know him, but were like, ah, he's going to, he's going to jack it in. He's going to, you know, he'll be gone in three months or six months or whatever. Um, and you kind of forget that actually he was working at underage League of Ireland level for the last couple of years and had shown a sort of his ability to dedicate himself to something. And that's what he's done. And I suppose for people who haven't seen shells this year haven't followed their story um, like he's actually built a team that is very unified like very sort of 